So welcome, this is the Murders at Karlov Manor set review. I'm here with Dylan and we are going to be going over uh, various cards from the set, a whole bunch of them. I think we have like a hundred different ones to cover in various formats, Pioneer, Popper, Legacy, Modern, etc. Anything that we think is interesting, it's been... Uh, so we're recording this on February 12th. So the set has been out for almost a week. So we're getting some preliminary results on what is in the set and what's working. But uh, some of that we're going to get our analysis from the results that we're seeing and some we're going to speculate. So again, if anyone is not familiar, would you like to introduce yourself, Dylan? Uh, yeah, I'm just a magic player from SoCal. Been playing competitively for quite a while. One of the moto grinders right now for Pioneer. Uh, just, uh, yeah. All right, so our first card is Assemble the Players. So I'll be describing what each of these cards do as we get to them. So if you're just listening to the video and don't like have it up in a second window or you're just listening to the audio only, hopefully you can follow along. So Assemble the Players is a two mana white enchantment. It says you may look at the top card of your library anytime. And once each turn, you may cast a creature spell with power two or less from the top of your library. So right away, this is sort of a card advantage engine type thing in like white weenie decks. Specifically, it seems like it could probably go in mono white humans or some kind of similar deck. Maybe Amalia, I'm not sure, you know. There's plenty of at least pioneer decks that play a lot of power two and less creatures. So what do you think, Dylan? Yeah, I know this card was kind of getting a bunch of hype. Uh, when it was first spoiled, because there was a lot of small creature decks uh, in, in Pioneer, Amalia, Humans. Uh, you can use Spirits to kind of abuse the once each turn, because if you have a creature with Flash on top, uh, you can play that, so like Spell Queller. Uh, and the uh, the yeah, Fairy, so, the 2-1 Fairy that like draws an extra card. Yeah, yeah, yeah Fairy Mastermind, yeah. So, so and, and in Standard as well, there's a lot of Flash creatures that see a lot of play too, um, and there's a lot of like two-power creatures uh, in the format. Um, but I don't think it's really panning out to really see much play anywhere, but it can fit into like a lot of uh, decks. I think that mostly has to do with the fact that guess Lo Get Lost hits like any fucking permanent type. So. Yeah, I've so uh, this kind of card I see a lot and they always look a lot better than they actually play. So there's like, there's this one, there's all the red ones that are like two mana enchantments that say when you hit your opponent, you like impulse draw a card for the turn. And they always look so good. They seem like they should be so good in aggro decks and they just never really pan out. Yeah, it just requires a little bit too much uh, uh, investment. Like, you know, a card like uh, Experimental Frenzy is an example of like how to do it right for aggro decks where you just, it just lets you play like a bunch of cards. Um, restricting to like once per turn just doesn't really help solve the issue when your deck is a bunch of really weak cards. I think like a comparison was like Takasia's Welcome, um, but that's actually a little better because drawing a card is better um, because it, like you're gonna have like removal spells or counter spells or other cards like that. All right, and I so I believe the the card has not actually panned out that well. Like I don't think it's really succeeding so far. Yeah, yeah. Now for what it's worth, I think part of that is uh, at least in Pioneer is because humans and spirits are just completely unplayable decks because of the presence of Amalia. Um, so the decks that would want access to the, this effect like just don't exist. Uh -huh. So is, is it really just Amalia? Like what is caught? Like I know that spirits and humans are way on the downswing to the point that no one's really running yeah. them anymore. And it feels to me like, it, it, is it really just because one deck exists? I thought also like Copter was oh. contributing to spirits being a, you know, not yeah. a good deck anymore. So Rakdos is not very popular right now, but, but Rakdos having access to Copter, like uh, Rakdos was already very good against spirits and, um, pretty even against humans and then copter just like way push that over the edge um and then also you have amalia which just like you, those decks can like never beat and then phoenix is also like pretty good against spirits and fine against humans um and humans and spirits also were like weak to convoke so like it was like sure it was a confluence of decks but like of the two mainstays like amalia like like is pretty popular i mean i, I just top did the challenge this weekend with amalia um, and the current trophy leader is playing Amalia. Um, so, like, it alone can be enough to, like, discourage people from playing it because that matchup is, like, unfixable, if that makes sense. All right, so let's move on. So next card is Case of the Gateway Express. So this is our first case card, so I'll be explaining both of this card and cases so that we don't have to keep re-explaining cases as we go through. So cases are enchantments, and they've got three parts. There's the first part, which is usually some kind of effect that they do immediately. Then the second part is an end step trigger that has some sort of condition that you have to meet to get the trigger. 
And then once you've satisfied that condition, the third part is whatever you get as the payoff for satisfying that condition. So in this case, Case of the Gateway Express is a two mono white enchantment. It says when this enters the battlefield, you choose target creature you don't control and each creature you control deals one damage to that creature. So basically two mana deal damage to a creature equal to however many creatures you control. Although it's not exactly that because death touch can change that, but basically that. Then to solve it, you have three or more creatures attack this turn. And then once it's solved, creatures you control get plus one plus zero. So a card that is obviously good in like go wide aggro because the first mode depends on you having a bunch of creatures. The condition requires that you attack with a bunch of creatures. And then the third mode pumps your creatures. So this is not a card that I originally had on the list. So what did you see in this card, Dylan? Uh, I think this is one of the better cards from the set, actually. Uh, in both... <laughs> In both standard and pioneer right now at least i don't think it's particularly playable in the more powerful formats but there are a bunch of go wide strategies that are like on the cusp of being really good or that like have been good and we're actually starting to see to see this card push out cards like uh bushwhacker and imidanes in pioneer in convoke they're just straight up playing this instead um even uh boros goblins has been starting to play this as its white card instead of rally um just because like Having an anthem that doubles as removal is like really powerful uh, for like uh, Convoke. And Boros Convoke is actually like a real standard deck now. It's now it's because of a card we'll get to later as well. But they they do get access to both these effects. So essentially, it's remo it's there. removal plus an anthem. Yes, yes. And the condition is really easy to meet on the turn that you play it. So because you, usually you're going to have like three creatures because of resolute reinforcements. So you play this on three, you kill their blocker, you get to it or, or they have like one creature and you can like chump attack uh, into that. And then it solves immediately. So like on your next turn, you get the bonus. So. I think we can also say as a general rule that when we're talking about these cards, we're usually going to be talking about them in the context of pioneer or formats that are on that power level because it takes yeah. a lot to break into modern and beyond. Yes. Yeah. If there's a card specifically where I'm good, where I would talk about like modern or legacy, I'll like specifically mention it because yeah, most cards are not designed for those formats. Okay. So then we've got case of the uneaten feast. So this is a single white mana enchantment case. The first part is whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, you gain one life. Then to solve it, you've gained five or more life this turn. So on your end step, if you've gained five or more life, it's solved. And then once it's solved, you can sacrifice it to make it so that creature cards in your graveyard gain. You may cast this card from your graveyard until end of turn. So I think the obvious position that this card uh, show, would maybe show up in is the Amalia deck. Amalia is already running cards like Lunark Veteran. It wants cheap life gain effects that trigger when creatures enter the battlefield under your control. And this doubles up as having the solved mode be able to, again, recast creatures from your graveyard, which Amalia already wants to do. They're playing Return to the Ranks after all. I think what is potential, what is probably stopping this from seeing play is that it's not a creature and Amalia really wants to be playing creatures for Court of Calling so you can Coco into them. If you have a Lunark veteran and it dies, you can return to the ranks it from your graveyard. And, and also if you ever get to the point where you're going off with Amalia and you're binning a bunch of stuff, any creatures you bin can then get back with return to the ranks. But Case of the Uneaten Feast uh, obviously doesn't fit into any of these because it's not a creature. So... What do you think of this, Dylan? Yeah, so I had initially looked at it for Amalia as well. Um, currently, I don't think it being not a creature matters as much anymore because we've started kind of like trimming on Return to the Ranks. Sometimes you you board out like uh, Chords, Cocos, or Return to the Ranks for like Thought Seizes post board, where a card like this is better. The biggest issue with me has been five life is a lot, um, even for that deck. Because basically, if you're gaining five plus life, it probably means you're in the process of comboing anyway, so it's really hard to solve yes. it. Yes, or you have like just a bunch of uh, like life gain creatures and not really much else. Um, there is one upside that this has that Return to the Ranks doesn't, and that's because of a big trend in Amalia right now is to play a bunch of Skyclave Apparitions and Sentinels of the Nameless City, and this can actually let you cast threes from your graveyard. So there is like some small advantage, but it's mostly just that I think it's a little bit too hard to... Uh, to enable but maybe we see like a standard deck or something so basically it's just like you may as well just play lunark veteran yeah yeah like currently you play lunark and prosperous innkeeper and sometimes there will be a couple others that you could play and we just choose not to play them so but basically the point is that because you can't get the solve too easily like yeah. it's essentially just worse than playing those life gain creatures yep yep yeah yeah five is just so much all right 
So then what is probably gonna be one of the more popular cards in the set, Delny Streetwise Lookout is a three mana legendary white creature. It's a two, two human scout. And it says creatures you control with power two or less can't be blocked by creatures with power three or greater. And then most importantly, the second part, if an ability of a creature you control with power two or less triggers, that ability triggers an additional time. So it is yet another variant on the various panharmonicon effects that we've been seeing. In this case, it only triggers off of creatures with power two or less, but it does trigger off of any of their triggers, not just ETB triggers, and it itself is a creature. So uh, aside from any potential EDH applications, I think the most obvious home for this card is humans because there are a bunch of humans that will trigger from it. So Luminarch Aspirant, Thali's Lieutenant, Brutal Cathar gets to exile two creatures. Lauren of the Third Path gets to blow up two artifacts or enchantments. Coppercoat Vanguard, uh, notably Ward is a trigger. So it basically doubles the ward on the Coppercoat Vanguard. But even outside of humans, there are various other creatures that also have triggers that you might want to double up on. So things like Spirited Companion to draw two cards, Skyclave Apparition to eat two things, Voice of Resurgence will trigger twice. So what is your uh, assessment of Delmi? Yeah, I, so... <laughs> I'm actually uh, one of the only Amalia players that is currently playing it in the deck, and my top eight, I was playing it, and the card is is incredibly powerful. Um, I think pairing it with cards like Charming Prince is like pretty good too. Knight of Autumn, Skyclave Apparition, yeah, Voice of Resurgence is a very natural home for it because you get a, you get double triggers on death and double triggers when they cast a spell during your turn. Um, I think it fits. There used to be like a green white fauna shaman deck in Pioneer, and most of that deck would get doubled by Delmi as well. Um, yeah, I, I think the card is good. Um, I don't think it's like like broken or anything, and that's mostly because it's a two two. So like, it's really hard to ever attack or block with it. Um, if it was a two three, I think it would be like super problematic. Um, but actually, like the first mode of like creatures control power two or less can't be blocked by creatures power three greater comes up all the time. I actually won a match um, with Amalia because my opponent could not block with their Quake Bringer against my creatures. So I just got to attack them twice. Um, that seems to be the case in a lot of matchups. Like Rakdos probably mostly doesn't have anything that can block it either. Yep. yep. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So uh, if you are playing Delny and it's not part of some sort of combo and it's just for value, how many copies of Delny do you think you run? I think it depends on if you have ways to find it. But um, like I, I think I think one to two. Um, I don't think there's any deck that would want more than that. Like um, not even humans would want more than two of them? No, because one of the issues, too, is, like, a lot of these decks already have an issue drawing too many, like, uh, if you're humans, like, add lines and stuff, and that card is, like, just, like, um, wins the game unopposed. Um, but I think that, like, it's not, like, so critical to, like, any deck at the moment that, like, it's really worth playing uh, more copies, even though something that you can do that's pretty cool with it is it does turn Prosperous Innkeeper into a free spell um, because you get two treasures, um, so any of the creatures that like make treasures that have like two power, you can sometimes do some some crazy stuff with. I would also like to point out that for this list right here, I intentionally left Adeline off of it because yes, while it technically yeah. does trigger Adeline, it only triggers Adeline if you literally just have Adeline and Delny in play, and then after yeah. that, you don't get to trigger it more. Yeah, similar with like um, obviously if your Luminarch is like more powerful, it's no longer you know right. So um, you do have to be careful. I actually almost lost a game. Uh, because I cracked a map token targeting my voice of resurgence instead of my other creature. And my voice became a 3-3 and was no longer able to double uh, with Delmi. So it does require a little bit of a uh, little bit of like work, but really powerful. All right. Next up, another card that's probably going to be an auto staple in a bunch of places. Doorkeeper Thrall. This is a two mana one two creature with flash. It has flying and it says artifacts and creatures entering the battlefield don't cause abilities to trigger. So this is yet another in the long line of torpor orb effects stapled onto a creature. So I think the most obvious thing is uh, the most comparable creature is Hushbringer with the main differences being uh, lifelink obviously on Hushbringer, although I don't think that's that relevant. So the main differences are flash and stopping artifact ETBs on the Doorkeeper Thrall and versus uh, Hushbringers is dying triggers don't trigger. But I think probably in general, Doorkeeper Thrall is gonna be better. The Flash is a pretty big addition, also huge for EDH. So essentially this card comes down to like, are you playing a deck that already wanted to play Hushbringer? Well, then you probably just also wanna play Doorkeeper Thrall instead of Hushbringer. Uh, also, there are some notable artifacts that this stops. There's not too many, but 
The One Ring and Essica's Chariot are some of like the biggest examples of artifacts that it stops to some extent. So probably the big places there's just going to be like, again, any deck that was already running Hushbringer and Pioneer and Modern, and then this is going to be a EDH staple for uh, White Stacks decks. What do you think, Dylan? Yeah, I, I think that's pretty spot on. I don't think there's a ton of decks in Tournament of Magic that really want this effect, but there are some. And I think this is definitely, I think Flash makes it like the best one um, pretty close. Like, uh, yeah, the, the artifacts uh, comes up as well against like One Ring protection and stuff. Um, I was surprised by how, like when I was looking up the artifacts that have ETBs that actually get played, I was surprised by how few of them there are though. Yes, yes. In Pioneer, there's a lot of them that see play are, are like portable hole, basically, you know. Um, where it's like not the most important thing uh, to prevent, but uh, but yeah, you know, I, 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 there's not a lot of Hushbringer decks, but the ones that exist probably play this. So can I also say that Doorkeeper Thrall like Bowmasters? I'm really not liking the trend that they're doing of putting stacks on Flash creatures. Yeah, I mean, it. it I think it's fine for cards like even Mind Sensor and stuff. Like in general, I kind of dislike how they play. Um, and they do tend to punish, uh, they do tend to not work as well as stacks creatures, you know, like, like, um, because you can't have as like powerful stats if it has flash either, uh, which leads to this like awkward scenario. Like, I don't really like the flash component of containment priest, for example, even though it like makes that card, uh, significantly more powerful. Uh, I don't really like the gotcha type, uh. I think the gotcha for me is that I don't like the fact that you get to maintain value even after doing it. So if you have, if this card was right. just like, an instant that said you get that effect for the turn, I'd be fine with it. Like, you know, you try to do your reanimate, or not reanimate, you try to do your uh, your ETB trigger thing, like Thassa's Oracle or whatever, they stop you with their spell, you've one for one to each other, right? What I really don't like is stacks effects like Orcish Bowmasters in this, where you get to maintain a threat afterwards, or cards like Dress Down and Hallowed Moonlight, where they can't trip, so you're up a card, right. or you can just cycle them regardless. Yeah. Yeah, I, I kind of feel that way on most of them. Um, I also think that, like, I, I like it when there's a little more counterplay. Um, like, I feel like you should be rewarded for preempting your creatures, um, like playing them sorcery speed. Like, I like to constantly honor guard because, like, you know, you're kind of forced to just play sorcery speed, has relevant stats, but it's a little bit bigger. Like, I, I prefer that kind of design. All right, so moving on. Make Your Move is a three mana white instant, and it says destroy target artifact, enchantment, or creature with power four or greater. So I'm just gonna ask Dylan, do you have any idea why I put this on the list? Uh, I mean, I don't know anything specifically, but like, I mean, Get Lost doesn't hit artifacts and, you know, like Destroy Evil has seen play in like both Pioneer and Standard. So I don't think this is like, you know, too far off. So I put this on here specifically for Popper because this is the first okay. Popper legal effect that does this. That is a card that's able to hit artifacts, enchantments, and uh, creatures of some right. kind. Right. Yeah. So destroy yeah, evil. Yeah. Destroy evil is legal in Popper, but this is the first version of that card that also hits artifacts. Yes. Yeah. It also. Yeah. Now I do have to say it's probably not going to see play in Popper. I think it's just too expensive. Yeah. Really but it is the first. It is the first modal card that hits all of those different types in Popper in white. Yeah. I mean that, that makes sense. Although, if you're playing this, it presumably means you're trying to hit artifacts slash enchantments, obviously, because if you just needed to hit creatures, you could play something else. And if you're specifically trying to hit artifacts, Dust to Dust is a much better card for white decks in the yeah. sideboard, but it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a much, it's a more versatile effect, at least. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's move on. No Witnesses is a four mana white sorcery, double white pips. It says each player who controls the most creatures investigates, then destroy all creatures. So this is a card you added. So why is No Witnesses a card you wanted to discuss? Uh, mostly for standard. So it's not abundantly clear yet whether or not this or Depop is better. Um, because with this, your opponent is basically always getting a card, but they have to pay two mana for it. Whereas with Depop, they're not always getting a card. Um, and we just haven't really figured out which is better. Because uh, obviously, like if your opponent doesn't really have a good window to crack the clue that they're going to get to draw a card, like this is better than Depop in a format. Um, but that's mostly it just because like in standard, uh, people haven't really, uh, fully decided yet, um, which one is better. But isn't uh, Sunfall think... also legal? So like, I get that it's more mana, but isn't the exile better? Yes, but you, you do play four mana sweepers in standard. So, um, because of the mana, um, it's usually not like a four of, it's usually like one or two copies. 
Uh, but so that's mostly why, just because like there is an actual uh, uh, decision to be made when deck building in standard now between this versus Depop. So moving on, we've got Novice Inspector. Uh, this is just Thraben Inspector, but for those who don't remember what that card does, it's a single white mono one, two human detective creature. And it says when it enters the battlefield, investigate. So it's literally just another Thraben Inspector. So now uh, you have five through eight copies of Thraben Inspector and you can make the investigate deck. Yep. Uh, probably mostly going to be relevant for Popper where Thraben Inspector is way more popular. Although there are occasionally decks outside of Popper that run Thraben Inspector, but this is basically, did your deck already want to run Thraben Inspector? Did you want to run more than four copies? Here's more than four copies. Yep. Not really much to say about that. Yeah, so I, I think um, there's a little bit of subtlety in it, uh, in, in Pioneer especially. Um, the presence of another Thraben Inspector makes Convoke so much more consistent now, post-board, because you don't have to play Ornithopter. So Convoke's like average card quality gets a lot better. The deck's just way more consistent and smooth. Uh, and more more things that turn on uh, Warden of the Inner Sky on Curve is really nice. Uh, we're actually seeing uh, uh, the standard Gleeful Demolition deck actually be playable now because you have Thraben Inspector, and I think that deck's actually quite good. Uh, and having being able to play um, the eight Thraben Inspectors plus the, the Blue Siren means that we're actually seeing Blue-Eyed and Soul make a little bit of a comeback in Pioneer as well. But again, the, those decks would all play Thraven Inspector before, but... Uh, sometimes eight copies just makes them actually a good deck. So. All right. So moving on, we've got Trouble in Pairs. This is the only card on the list that is from the Commander decks. So this card is yeah. not legal in modern and lower formats. So it's just Legacy in EDH. I'd, I'd never seen it. I, I had to look it up. <laughs> so Trouble in Pairs is a four mono white enchantment. It has two white pips. And it says if an opponent would begin an extra turn, the player skips that turn instead. And whenever an opponent attacks you with two or more creatures, draws their second card each turn, or casts their second spell each turn, you draw a card. So right away, this is similar to the uh, Krom effect. The main things here, the extra turn and the, the attacking with two creatures isn't going to come up a lot, but players drawing a second card or casting a second spell is going to come up all the time. Yeah, every turn. <laughs> In EDH, at least. So, uh, yeah. so it's sort of like the White Rhystic Study sort of a card. I mean, it's not as good, obviously, but... This does seem probably like it's going to be a staple in most white EDH decks that don't have access to blue or black. Oh, yeah. It's also a slightly awkward that the double white pips doesn't allow you to mono vault into it really fast. But other than that... Probably a good thing. <laughs> yeah, uh, like where you can mono vault into Smothering Tithe would be the other equivalent yeah. for mono white enchantment. But it's just really good card advantage quality in white. So it seems like pretty easy to include there. Oh, yeah. Outside of EDH, uh, I don't think it has any applications in 1v1. No, no, four, four minutes is just too much uh, for, like, Legacy, but uh, card seems uh, absolutely miserable in, uh, in Commander. Mm -hmm. So moving on, we've got Unyielding Gatekeeper. This is a two-mono white creature. It's a 3-2 Elephant Cleric, and it has Disguise for one and a white. So for those none familiar with Disguise, it's basically Morph, except the creature has Ward 2. So... You can cast the creature face down for three mana, three generic mana as a 2-2 creature with Ward 2, and then turn it face up for its disguise cost. So here the disguise cost is one and a white. And it says, when Unyielding Gatekeeper is turned face up, exile another target non-land permanent. If you controlled it, return it to the battlefield tapped. Otherwise, its controller creates a 2-2 white and blue detective creature token. So you can either play this as a two mana 3-2, or you can play this as a three mana 2-2 Ward 2 that you can flip for two so five mana total to either exile an opponent's non-land creature and turn it into a 2-2 two -two, or blink one of your own guys tapped or one of your own non-land permanents tapped this is a card you wanted to add to the list so discuss unyielding gatekeeper so there's two main reasons why i think like people should like keep a little bit of an eye on this card is one um it doesn't really have a home in standard currently but that may change with rotation in the fall it it I mean, it's certainly like a powerful effect, and we are losing um, a good amount of like current format staples in the fall. Um, and then the other one is I've actually like I did play a league. I went three two, so not 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 bad. Where I was playing this with Deathmiss Raptor, and it actually felt like really powerful um, in that shell. Um, so that that's it really is like you know Deathmiss Raptor stuff is you know there may be like some kind of pioneer deck that plays that card now, um, and I did like that. Yeah, notably it hits any non-land permanent, so like you can hit like temporary lockdowns and stuff. So 
Yeah. So just to discuss Disguise for a moment. So obviously it's an upgrade to Morph because the creature is, is, has Ward 2, but I still think paying three generic mana for a 2-2 two -two that has Ward 2 is just not good enough. So it's gonna largely depend on how powerful the turn the card face up effect is. And I think basically all the Disguise cards function in the same way. They're all creature stats. They've got some kind of Disguise cost. And then I, basically all of them have some sort of trigger or ability that uh, goes off when you flip it face up and don't really have anything else that happens when you just play them normally. Yeah. Yep. But to me, it just seems not worth it to pay three for a two, two, and then have to pay more to flip it over. What do you, yeah, what are I mean, your thoughts on that? Like it's like, it's pretty like, it's already like difficult in magic to play like a three minute two, two that does a bunch of stuff. Uh, the turn that you play it. Um, it's definitely not like you need like upside to matter a little bit more or you need to be, you need to be one of those weird decks that is like fine paying extra mana for like slightly more powerful effects. And there's not a ton of that right now. All right, so we are done with the white cards. So moving on to blue. Behind the mask is a single blue pip instant. As an additional cost to cast this spell, you may collect evidence six. I'll get to that in a bit. Until end of turn, target artifact or creature becomes an artifact creature with base power and toughness 4-3. If evidence was collected, it has base power and toughness 1-1 one, one until end of turn instead. So collect evidence is as a cost of playing the spell or activating the ability, you can exile cards with a total mana value of whatever the evidence cost is or greater from your graveyard. So in this case, collect evidence 6 means in order to get the additional mode, you have to exile mana value 6, or six plus from your graveyard. Uh, I added this to the list mostly for Popper Infect because it is one of only a few cards in Popper that for one mana can essentially add three power to one of your creatures. The only other cards in Popper that do that are basically Giant Growth in green and then red has a bunch of them. But for Infect deck specifically, uh, there's Giant Growth and then there's like a few of the other ones, but they're not as good. Like there's Groundswell, but there's not really fetch lands in Popper. So it's harder to get that off. So this is potentially just another card that can turn that can plus three one of your infect creatures and i doubt you'll use the alt mode of like reducing the power of something else very much but it's an option i suppose what are your thoughts dylan yeah i mean that that all scans i was kind of confused why this was on there but popper makes sense mm -hmm. I, I have a feeling there's going to be a lot of uh popper stuff that i have on here that you don't understand why it's here and a lot of pioneer stuff that i don't understand why it's here right right yeah i used to play a lot of popper but i have not uh, touched it i've found it to be of the 1v1 formats it's the best one so right now yeah i i'm just tired of a lot of the same uh the same things in that format <laughs> so. so moving on from behind the mask i guess also there's you don't have to just target a creature. You can turn one of your artifacts into a 4-3, although I can't really think of any situation where I'd want to do that. But I mean, I guess like, I don't know, if you've got some kind of blue-red prowess deck, maybe you play a card that produces like a random clue token or something, and then your clue can become a creature. So it's mm -hmm. sort of like plus four in that case. Yeah, kind of neat. All right, so moving on, we've got Case of the Filched Falcon. This is a single blue mana enchantment case. When it enters, you investigate. Then to solve it, you control three or more artifacts, a very difficult cost to overcome, obviously. And then on the last mode, uh, you can pay three and sack it to put four plus one plus one counters on target non-creature artifact. It becomes a zero zero bird creature with flying in addition to its other types. So similar to Insol Artifact, uh, Black Staff of Waterdeep, I would note that one of the big differences here is that the creature has flying, which is a yes. A big one and also that yeah, yeah. this card always makes to always makes uh, a clue on the first mode so it's replacing itself at some point presumably also cards that are two permanents for only one mana especially when one of them is an artifact typically are very good and this yep. just seems like a card that's obviously going to slot right into like the insole type decks yep and it already has the the we kind of figured out that and initially we were kind of playing like three or four uh and like zero zoetic glyph but uh, the consensus now is you generally play like two copies of this in the Insult X, and then you play a couple copies of Zoetic Glyph or Blackstaff. Um, and just, it just rounds out the deck really nicely. Instant speed in Soling is actually like super relevant because once the case is solved, you can do it at, at instant speed. So it um, helps you mitigate some board wipes. Mm -hmm. I mean, not really much more to say about that. So nope, nope. <laughs> next up is Case of the Ransacked Lab, three mana enchantment. In this case, it is instant and sorcery spells you cast cost one less. Then to solve it, you've cast four more instant and sorcery spells this turn. Again, a huge hurdle overcome. A little bit harder than the, the first case that we discussed, but <laughs> not that bad. And then if you've solved it, whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, draw a card. All of your spells become cantrips. So 
As the uh, resident Phoenix expert, why is this card good or bad in uh, Phoenix and Pioneer? So initially I had thought like, you know, well, may maybe this is like your plan versus like the rest in peace decks. Um, I think currently it's probably not going to make the cut, um, but it is actually easy to solve and get the case going. Um, but the two main problems with that is drawing extra cards is not always very good. World with Shouldred. Um, and you do tend to board out a bunch of your one mana removal spells in like the control matchups. Um, and then the third issue, I guess, is that for whatever reason, all the control decks now uh, have a bunch of cards that disregard permanent type. So playing enchantments just doesn't really matter when get lost, March yeah. of Otherworldly Light, Leyline Binding. Yep, yeah. yep, yep. So you can't. Rel so you need your uh, you need your enchantments, specifically enchantments, to provide more upfront value. Your artifacts can provide longer term value because uh, get lost doesn't hit them. So like card like Reckon or Bankbuster is fine to play against control, but you wouldn't want to play. A record or bankbuster enchantment against a control deck so i think that that's like kind of why it's like kind of meh um i actually also, prefer um to to play like more creatures because they can't be dove it's vetoed also uh phoenix has a lot of cards that only cost one mana so the cost reduction here doesn't matter as much yeah yeah okay so aside from phoenix does this have potential applications elsewhere because like phoenix is the one that's obviously comes to mind the first because it's yeah. Blue deck plays a bunch of spells, but you know, you could play another deck that isn't Phoenix. Yeah, um, nothing that immediately jumps to mind, but I think, I mean, we, we've we seen like um, some like Baral decks and stuff before, like Lotus Field has played like, you know, Baral before. Um, maybe this is better than Baral. Um, usually casting four, usually you have the win in hand, but maybe there's some games where like this kind of is like a, pour, a another pour over the pages. Uh, the builds are kind of robust right now, so I'm not sure that they would make that. And they they don't typically play Brawl either. I think if this card does see play, it's not going to see play in Phoenix or Lotus Field. It's probably going to be a whole new deck. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of how I. That's kind of what I suspect. So. By the way, expect to hear the the phrase as the resident Phoenix player. Can you explain why this card is good, Dylan? A lot. <laughs> okay, so moving on. Conspiracy Unraveler is a 7 mana 6-6 six, six creature, Sphinx Detective with flying, and it says you may collect evidence 10 rather than pay the mana cost for spells that you cast. So instead of paying for spells, you can exile 10 mana value worth of cards from your graveyard. Uh, once again, Dylan, you had this card on the list. I did not originally. So why did you want to discuss this one? Uh, so it's already kind of making waves in standard. Um, there, If you can cheat this into play, uh, there are a huge amount of games where you just win the game on the spot um, because you can chain a bunch of different big spells together. Um, and there's currently a few ways to put it into play on turn four or five. Um, but also one of the pioneer decks I was playing for a little bit, the idea was instead of a Traxa or Gear Hulk, you can just creativity or transmog into this and you win the game um, because you can, uh, sure, you could do like omniscience, but you can cast like an Enter the Infinite or Apex of Power. Um, and uh, Magma Opus also like puts eight mana value into your graveyard like pretty early. So, uh, so like if you discard a ma uh, Magma Opus and then you cast um, a Creativity on the on a token or uh, a Transmog on a token, that's already twelve in the graveyard. So you get to cast a card from hand for free. And if it's like an Apex of Power, you just like cast your whole deck and play the game. Um, so th this card's already kind of seeing some waves in like combo centric. Uh, decks but i i don't think it's anything tier one but it is a playable standard deck so i would also note increasingly there are lots of cards that are high mana value but not really because you can play them for cheaper or whatever so just a few things yeah. are like various delve spells cards like ley line binding that are cost reduced there's the In standard herd migration um there's the cha the channel game. cards cycling cards yeah. the lord of the rings land cyclers that are six mana into the graveyard immediately yep yep yeah, so it's, it's pretty reasonable. Also of note, um, if you cast a 10 mana spell f with Conspiracy and Raveler and it goes to the graveyard, you can just use that to free cast another uh, big spell. So you can change stuff pretty well with it. I will say I am personally dubious on this card, but it, from your description, it does sound better than I thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's not like tier one or anything, but it's definitely it's definitely a playable strategy, which is cool. So moving on, we've got Cryptic Coat. This is a three mana artifact equipment in blue, and it says when it enters the battlefield, you cloak the top card of your library, then attach Cryptic Coat to it. So you turn the top card of your library face down as a 2-2 creature with Ward 2, 
Equipped creature gets plus one, plus zero, and can't be blocked. So the creature, so it's this three mana for a three two unblockable ward two. And then you can pay two mana, including a blue mana, to return it to its owner's hand. So I think the first place that everyone thought about this card for was Stoneforge Mystic in Modern. Now, Stoneforge Mystic is generally just gonna go fetch Cauldra Complete, and that's probably correct most of the time, yes. but this is a option to go fetch. And in particular, it's an option to go fetch because you can pay, essentially you can start looping it. So you can you can like pay the two, bounce it back to your hand, pay the two for Stoneforge, put it back into play and keep just making additional two, two ward twos. Yep. Outside of that, I don't know if it really has any applications outside of like Stoneforge shenanigans, but what do you think? Yeah, so uh, this is actually one where I'm gonna bring up Legacy for a little bit. Uh, people have actually been playing this with uh, um, Freaks and Dreadnought uh, in Legacy. It's a it's another enabler for like Stifle Knot decks, uh, and so there's like that. But uh, this is a weird card where I think it's one of the few cards where I think it's kind of bad in Pioneer, but like much better in all the other formats. It's actually seeing a bunch of play in Standard right now, just as a supplemental three drop. Most Standard decks are like very creature heavy, so it's pretty easy to uh, uh, to turn the creature face up. There's cards like uh, Preacher of the Schism, which like. If you can hit that off the top and then you turn it face up, it matters. Uh, Gix, uh, stuff like that. So it is seeing playing standard as like a two or three of, um, and a little bit in Pioneer, uh, mostly in like blue black control as a sideboard card, similar to like Fabled and Mirror Breaker, where you just sport into mid range three drops. Um, but I think the coolest application is uh, is Dreadnought and Legacy. This card is expensive now. It's a money card in the set. It's like a six seven dollar rare. Um, I ended up. It was like the only card that I actually ended up pre ordering. Uh, for this set, so I was pretty happy about that. But uh, but yeah, it's it's a weird one in that I don't think it's very good in Pioneer. Uh, <laughs> so. By the way, as a just as a rules clarification, do you does the creature maintain the ward two after you turn it face up? Uh, I don't believe so. We should probably confirm that. Like, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that's a characteristic of um, card being cloaked. All right, so having looked up the release notes, there is no clarification on whether the creature gets to maintain Ward 2. Based on the wording, I would guess that it doesn't when you turn it face up, but it's unclear. Yeah, I haven't had it come up in... Well, I did actually have it come up in Pioneer, but I don't remember if it had the Ward 2 because I cast a Cryptic Coat um, in Blue, Red, and Soul, and I actually I hit Hazard off of it, and I did flip up my Hazard for it, but I don't remember if it had a Ward all right. So next up is Deduce. This is a two mana blue instant, and it says draw a card and investigate. So the card that it's closest to is Think Twice. Think Twice. Although Think Twice was worse because the flashback on Think Twice costs three. In this case, you're paying you're paying four mana to draw two cards separated into two mana installments. I've seen this card show up a little bit in like Blue White Control and Pioneer. It seems okay. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think it's better in like blue black control, which generally doesn't get to leverage like Teferi as much. Um, but it is really good in like creativity, um, which is mostly where it's been popping up. It's uh, just cycle a card, make a token that's hard to interact with, basically. Yep, yep. And that deck just wants more early draw spells. Like Impulse was always really bad, and sure, Impulse is better like at finding specifically what you need, but you really want to go up on cards. So, yep. That's All right. really yep, nothing much. It's like it's a decent-ish card that's going to see play in some Pioneer deck. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So moving on, we've got Forensic Gadgeteer, a 3 mana blue 2-3 creature, Vidalcan Artificer Detective. Whenever you cast an artifact spell, investigate. And activated abilities of artifacts you control cost one less to activate. This effect can't reduce the mana cost in can't reduce the mana in that cost to less than one mana. So basically, it's a two three that whenever you cast an artifact, it makes a clue that you only have to pay one to crack. Although if it ever goes away, then the clue is just a regular clue. It also reduces the cost of all of your artifact activations, not just clues. So immediately, this is yet another in the line of cards like Psy Master Thopterist or Chrome Host Seed Shark. In this case. Rather than getting creatures, you're getting clues, which seems like it would generally be better. The stats are also roughly in line with those cards. I think they're generally worse, though, because Chrome Host and Thy both have four toughness. This has three toughness, which means it gets hit by Fire Impulse, Torch the Tower, all of those spells. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think this card's ultimately going to be a miss. I haven't really seen it show up anywhere yet. Um, you can do some cool things, I guess, with like a bunch of zero mana artifacts, but um because it, it limits the cost reduction to one if you have a second copy you don't get to crack the clues so you can't like generate it so you can't use it to like make another build your own sram basically um but so i think it's like probably gonna end up being uh, a little bit of a miss um 
But yeah, being a two three is just like kind of bad for utility creatures. Like you want you want higher toughness, and in Pioneer specifically, a better draw engine for artifacts currently is a call a call um, from uh, Cavern Zixon, and that's a three mana one five. Um, so and that's actually seeing a bunch of play in like uh, the blue white War of Invention deck. Um, so so let me ask you. If you just if you ignore the stats, it just based yeah. on the ability, do you think this is a better ability than either Psy or Chrome Host? I think it's better than Psy, um, but worse than Chrome Host. So you would value the like big incubate tokens more than uh, more than uh, one mana clues? Yes. Yeah. It, it, Chrome Host is really good. Um, I think the I think the incubate is like you know pretty powerful, but I don't value Thopters very much. So in general, the the places that I've seen this in, I think Chrome Host mostly shows up in Pioneer in like blue white yes. and Psy when it's shown up has been in the uh legacy what is the deck name eight cast yeah eight cast eight cast do you think this could go in like eight cast for example that's possible i mean i i don't know enough i mean well i guess the other thing too right is this goes infinite with basalt monolith um right yes so that alone like you know may actually be something um so yeah. so I, I think it slots more into like older formats uh, mm-hmm there is a there is a like uh what is the eight key in legacy as well there's the deck that's just mm-hmm. one ring and like a ton of artifact ramp and keys that untap the ring yep maybe but that deck plays grim monolith and this just makes grim monolith neutral doesn't add on to it but i guess you could maybe also play basalt yeah i mean oftentimes the deck plays uh basalt monolith anyway um but i think like if you're already moving away from like the straight colorless version to play blue like you just play a different deck I guess my main point is that I would say this card is similar enough to other cards that we've already seen see play in decks. Yes, yes. All right, so let's move on from the Gadgeteer to Forensic Researcher, a three mana, one three creature merfolk detective. It has tap, untap another target permanent you control, or tap, collect evidence three, tap target creature you don't control. So this is a card you added to the list. Can you explain your reasoning? Uh, the only reason is because of a deeper pilgrimage in Pioneer um, with Kiora's follower, um, but we can do that in standard now. So if you have two forensic researchers and a deeper pilgrimage, you can make infinite merfolk. Gotcha. Um, so that's it. It's so just it's, more redundant. So it's a, a maybe combo thing. Yes. Yes. All right. Nothing more to say about that. We move on to Intrude on the Mind. This is a five mana blue instant, and it says reveal the top five cards of your library and separate them into two piles. An opponent chooses one of those piles, put that pile into your hand and the other into your graveyard, create a 0-0 colorless thopter artifact creature token with flying, then put a plus one counter on it for each card put into your graveyard this way. So basically fact or fiction for one more mana where you get a thopter, and the thopter will be, depends on how many cards are going to the graveyard, but on average two, so it's like going to be a two or three power thopter, presumably. Yeah, so notably, um, it's actually like, more like steam augury than factor fiction because your opponent picks the pile that you get you just separate them um but i do think something that will come up sometimes is piles of zero and five um, will actually come up with this card and i did do it once um, where your opponent has to give you either a five five flyer or five cards um main reason i wanted to talk about this is because it's actually seeing play in pioneer right now and i think that's the only format it should really see play in um, because you can curve it into Torrential Gear Hulk in the blue-black decks. Or, uh, in some cases, you play it in uh, blue-red Transmog, uh, because it's kind of like a bull drifter that you get to, because it, like, makes a token, uh, that you can just, like, find your cards with it. So it's mostly, like, for Torrential Gear Hulk decks. So. All right, moving on, we've got Mistway Spy, yet another in the very long line of upgraded flying men. This is a single blue 1-1 flying creature that is a merfolk. It has disguise for one and a blue, and it says when it's turned face up until end of turn, whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to a player, investigate. This is yet another card that you added to the list, so go ahead. Uh, two reasons. One, um, it's a merfolk, and it's actually a playable one-drop merfolk for that deck, which it the, in Pioneer, that's really what the deck is lacking, is one-drops. But we're close to being able to see like a small little flyers deck where you play a bunch of one-mana one-one flyers. Um, be viable and like this is actually probably one of the more playable disguise effects because it's a really powerful uh turn face up trigger so um and it plays really well with playing a bunch of flying men in your deck um but i think it's mostly just because like it's a flying merfolk and it's a one drop that's like playable uh scales a little bit later 
Uh, just something to keep an eye on. Would you say for this card that you're playing it mostly on the basis of playing it face up and that the face down yeah. is just a bonus that you'll get sometimes? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, because I'm very dubious on this. Like, I feel like the the one mana one one flyer has to be very good in your deck for you to want to play this. I think it's just because, like, Merfolk doesn't really have good one drops. Like, uh, you have Kamena's Speaker, which is, like, fine. Um, but I would rather have a flyer than a 2-2. Than a so. All right. Yeah. Moving on, we've got Prophet's Eidetic Memory. This is a two mana legendary enchantment. Enter the battlefield draw card, so it replaces itself immediately. You have no max hand size. At the beginning of combat on your turn, if you've drawn more than one card this turn, put X plus one counters on target creature you control, where X is the number of cards you've drawn this turn minus one. So basically, it alone will add a plus one counter to a creature on combat. And then the turn you play this, or at any other turn, if you've drawn more than one card, you get to add that many more plus one counters to a creature. So obviously good with like cheap cantrips or cards that draw a whole bunch of cards at once <laughs> so dylan as the resident phoenix expert is this card good in phoenix i'm actually playing one and there was a couple lists where i was playing more than one because i was playing some other cards like uh steam core scholar and stuff i actually like the card a lot if you're playing ledger shredder uh the curve is insane uh i the very first league uh, that i played with phoenix with this set uh i went up against lotus field and ended up winning the match by playing a turn two Ledger Shredder, turn three, play this, cast a cantrip, connive, discard, draw for cantrip, attack my opponent for five um, off of uh, off of just Ledger Shredder and Profits. Uh, like, uh, I, I think, I'm not sure what exactly the home for this card is. I do think it's uh, pretty playable in Phoenix, um, but it's such a unique, powerful effect that I'd be surprised if this does not see play in, uh, in Standard or Pioneer long term. It's just really, I think it's really good. All right. It does seem quite good with Ledger Shredder and Treasure Cruise and just all the cantrips and, you're going to play. Yeah. And Picklock gives you more uh, flyers as well, which is like kind of what you want for it. Oh, and you can start putting on a 1-3 Vigilance flyer too? Yes. Yes. And the other thing too is if you play Steam Core Scholar, it actually curves into it. So Scholar becomes a, uh, is a 3-mana 4-4 four, four Flying Vigilance, which may be something to look at for Standard. Gotcha. There's also a bunch of 3-mana draw 3, discard 2, unless you discard a specific type. Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. yep, yeah. Strikes me as a card that was probably intended for a, because they changed the rotation for standard. I think this was intended to be played in standard, um, but it can't be now because we have like Rafine and stuff. Mm -hmm. so. so moving on, we've got Reasonable Doubt. This is a two mana blue instant counter target spell unless its controller pays two. Suspect up to one target creature. This is the first suspect keyword we've got. So suspect means... A suspected creature has menace and can't block. So two mana, counter target spell unless the controller pays two and suspect up to one creature. So give a creature menace and make it not able to block. So again, this is a card you had on the list. Why do we want to play this as opposed to like make disappear? So this is just because of standard. Um, I'm playing this in my soldiers list right now um, because it does come up sometimes that you want to casualty make disappear or that no more lies would be, would be three. But I think what happens most of the time is I kind of just want to get a creature out of the way so my creatures can attack through it. Um, so you can suspect your opponent's creature and it can no longer block your soldiers. Um, so that's that's mostly why. So basically um, you, so want an, you want an aggressive deck that's also interested in counter spells. Yes, yes. Okay, moving on. We've got Reenact the Crime. This is a four mana blue instant. It has triple blue pips and it says exile target non-land card in a graveyard that was put there from anywhere this turn. Copy it, you may cast the copy without paying its mana cost. So notably, since it's an instant, you can hit things like Emrakul that have the graveyard shuffle trigger before it goes off. But I think mm -hmm. the major problem with this card is going to be, how do you get a card into your graveyard in a way that doesn't cost you anything so that you don't have to pay more than four in the same turn or yep. for an amount of mana that's like one, so you can do it for five or something and not have to pay a whole bunch. So what is your assessment? So this is one of the ways currently that you can do um to help enable like conspiracy unraveler in uh pioneer because you can use like a uh, uh, lightning axe to discard a card for one mana um but you also have uh you can go two mana discard magma opus and cast this if you need to as well in uh in pioneer oh that's pretty uh, sweet but notably yeah um but notably in modern this is kind of making some waves with uh underworld cookbook as a way to you can just you know 
turn four, you can just like cast an Emrakul or whatever. So you just go cookbook, discard, whatever huge thing it is, Emrakul, Omniscience, whatnot, yep. and then immediately reanimate it with this thing. Yep, yep. That strikes me as not being terribly consistent, but it is interesting. Yeah, as, as long as you have some other form of redundancy, it's probably fine. Like, uh, you know, so one of the lists I saw was doing like Oval Chase with Asmo stuff as like more redundancy with cookbooks. So, I mean, I think there's, you know, I think there's some, so you can kind of like two card Monty, a bunch of different things together, but. Uh, it's also kind of awkward like, that like, the cookbook you know, decks are usually like in the Golgari colors. Yes, you have to be blue black if you, <laughs> if you do that, so. But, or three color, I guess. So what are the best things to get back with this? Like Emrakul is one of them. Omniscience is yeah. another card. Tip, I assume if I'm going through all the hoops of getting this, I want to just win the game on the spot. Yeah, so that's why I actually don't like Omniscience that much because it also requires you to have other resources involved with it. Um, big fat things like Ulamog, Emrakul, uh, I think stuff like that. And notably you get to cast it, so you get the cast trigger. Well, you cast the copy, but the copy gets the trigger. Yep. yep. All right. So moving on, our final blue card is Steam Core Scholar. This is a three mana two, two creature. It's got flying and vigilance. And it says when it enters the battlefield, you draw two cards, then you discard two cards, unless you discard an instant sorcery or creature with flying. So Dylan, as the resident Phoenix expert yep. here. <laughs> yes, uh, I'm actually playing two copies right now. Um, uh, so the idea is it helps against rest in peace because it's actually card advantage. Um, against rest in peace you just throw away like a treasure cruise um or whatever um and you get a body plus that it's a draw discard spell that doesn't get hit by dovin's veto uh or spell pierce vigilance is actually pretty relevant in a world with wandering emperor um it, it's not quite as good as prismari command currently because you can't like uh blow up an artifact kill a creature you know whatever uh prismari command is really good in phoenix um, but i do like a uh, steam core scholar and it curves out of Proft's eidetic memory very well. Uh, it just becomes a three meta four four with that curve. So uh, I, I've been liking it quite a bit. Um, I think there's probably other homes for this type of card as well. So is this mostly like a sideboard card, like a crackling drake? Because you mentioned a lot of its use is in fighting stuff like Rest in Peace, or do you main deck this? Yeah. So I was playing it main deck, but I'm playing main deck Prismari Command instead, and I'm just playing this in the sideboard uh, along with Proft's. I mean, if you have a sufficient stockpile of cards that meet the requirements, probably mostly instant or sorceries, although Phoenix obviously has Phoenix pick lock, et cetera, pick then lock. it is then it is card advantage. Like you are going up a yes. card. It's it's I would say this card is like almost universally card advantage. Uh, I, I I've only discarded two cards like once or twice in all the games I've played. And one of those was I discarded two Phoenixes because you can still choose to discard two creatures with flying, so. All right, so moving on, we've got our first black card. So this is Case of the Stashed Skeleton. It's a two mana uh, case, obviously. So first, when it enters, you create a two one black skeleton creature token and suspect it, so it has menace and can't block. Then you solve by control no suspected skeletons. So you either have to remove the suspectedness, the, the suspicion from the skeleton, or more likely you just sack the skeleton or it dies. And then solved one in black, sacrifice this case, search your library for a card, put it into your hand, then shuffle, activate only as a sorcery. So it's demonic tutor on the final mode. So initially I discounted this because I looked at it and said, why in the world would I want to pay, you know, it's two mana to cast and then two mana to solve. So you're four mana to tutor. So it's diabolic tutor. Sure, it comes with a two one menace, but who cares? But I think where this actually might show up is in if there's a black transmogrify deck. This gives you a cheap yep. card that is not a creature that generates a token that you can transmog or creativity. And then if the opponent kills the token, like, you know, you try to transmog and they kill it, then you still get to Demonic Tutor to set up the next transmog. Yep. There actually is a black-red transmog deck in Pioneer. Um, usually in the two-drop slot, you would either play um, Hunt for Specimens or more commonly Tribute to Hirobi. Um, but I think Tribute to Hirobi is like pretty awful. And I think this is a little bit better. Um, and so I, I think playing this uh, makes more sense. Also, um, it does give you two bodies for potential Beseech Bargain as well. So um, even if you don't need to solve the case for that, it can be like, uh, you can sacrifice the case to Beseech to cast the Transmog targeting the tokens. So um, it does work pretty well with that. So I, I, I do think that's a good, yeah. All right, Deadly Cover-Up. This is a five mana sorcery, and it says as an additional cost to cast this spell, you may collect evidence six. Destroy all creatures. If evidence was collected, exile a card from an opponent's graveyard, then search their graveyard hand library for any number of cards with that name and exile them. 
The player shuffles, then draw a card for each then they draw a card for each card exiled from their hand this way. So it's a five mana sweeper that if you collect the evidence, if you collect evidence six, you get to cranial extract a card out of their graveyard, which would seem to be relevant against creature-based combo decks like Amalia and Greasefang. So like you can sweep them, kill their thing, and then extract all of the copies out of their deck. But it is also five mana and you need to collect evidence. So this seems like the kind of card that would be something as like a one of target for BTL. Do you think it has applications beyond that? Yeah, I, I think this card fundamentally changes Pioneer as a format in a bad way. Um, but I do think it fundamentally changes it. Um, yeah, currently the main thing to do is, yeah, you play it as a bring to light target in Niv, and you can just sweep the board against Amalia, Greasefang, or Phoenix, and you just hit all of the card that they had to play, and then the game is usually over if it's game one, because uh, there's not a lot of recourse from there. With cards like Leyline Binding and, you know, um, a bunch of removal spells, it's pretty reasonable to get Collect Evan 6 by that point. Um, but uh, even like the blue-black control decks and Esper control, uh, they play two to three copies of this now. Um, because you can take a hit or whatever, let your opponent develop, and then just catch up with this. Um, so I, I think giving uh, giving like the fair decks um, kind of like access to that, because a lot of Pioneer is built around like specific engine cards. Uh, in standard, it's kind of like flavor text for the most part. Like none of the decks are built around one specific engine, but... Pioneer has a lot of engine cards specifically, so uh, this forces all of those kinds of decks to have like different backup plans. So it's really powerful. So the verdict is good in Pioneer black-based control decks and as a one of BTL target. Yep. But you said it fundamentally changes Pioneer in a bad way. Is that because it just makes like the main deck of these mid-range sweeper decks too good against the combo creature decks? Yeah, like I like I I don't I think. Part of the interesting thing about bring to light and toolboxy stuff is getting to play a toolbox. But when you have one card that like kind of just like edges out all the other sweepers, it, I, I think it kind of like makes it pretty bad. Um, I also would like be I, I would like this card more if like backup plans actually mattered against Niv. But currently the backup plan for like say Grease Fang or Amalia is to play like mid range creatures, which already get absolutely destroyed by just hard casting a Niv so, uh, or an Omnath or whatever. So uh, the decks that this kind of hates on already don't have the ability to play a backup plan game one. Um, so that's why I, th I, I don't really like uh, how it, I think it will affect the format uh, because there's no ability for the deck for the, the decks that this hates on to like adapt back, if that makes sense. Gotcha. So. All right, so going to the next card, there is Illicit Masquerade. This is a four mana black enchantment with flash and it says... When it enters the battlefield, you put a imposter counter on each creature you control, and whenever a creature you control with an imposter counter, a counter on it dies, exile it, return up to one other target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield. So notably, there is no restriction on the creature that you reanimate. It's not limited by mana value, power, nothing. You can reanimate anything you want, and it's not limited by a number of activations. You can sacrifice any number of your creatures to get back any number of your creatures. Notably, uh, all the creatures with the imposter counters are being exiled, so it's not like an infinite engine. But what this does mean is that if you play like a self-mill deck of some kind, or you know a deck that is otherwise able to loot or bin away big creatures, and you have a sack outlet and like a bunch of small creatures, you can play this, sack one or more of your guys, and then reanimate a whole bunch of things at once. So what do you think of that, Dylan? Yeah, so... It's funny because I actually, when you sent me the list of cards, I actually double checked to make sure this was on there um, because there's actually a standard deck that uh, it's kind of fringe, but uh, it may be a little more popular that plays this. And the idea is you get this into play and you reanimate, um, forget the name of it, but I think it's from like uh, Brothers War or Freaksia or whatever. So you reanimate this card. Uh, this is when you cast, I think like uh, a non-creature spell, you make X one ones with haste equals to the mana value. So you use this to return it, and then you loop Beseeches over and over. So you, like, will sack one of the tokens, uh, cast Beseech, casting another Beseech, sacking your token, and just hit your opponent for, like, 40 damage. And you use this as a way to, like, cheat that card into play. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think anytime I see, like, four mana, the ability to reanimate two creatures, I think there's, like, absolutely some potential there. I haven't seen anyone played in Pioneer yet, but uh, there may be a home for it. Well, there's a lot of Golgari surveil self-mill yourself decks and yep. 
that play like a bunch of just crappy small creatures that you can easily get rid of or that also happen to already play sack outlets like priest yeah. of the forgotten also, gods woe strider etc yeah. also fable the mirror breaker is a card that exists as well uh, so so you just loot away your big, big giant bombs then you reanimate them yep yep so haven't seen it yet but powerful enough that it could see play absolutely all right Next up, we've got Long Goodbye. This is a two mana black instant. It can't be countered. Destroy target creature or planeswalker with mana value three or less. So right away, it's worse than Abrupt Decay because you can't hit anything. You can only hit creatures or planeswalkers. But basically, if you are in black, but you don't have green, but you want this effect, then you can play this. Whereas before, you just didn't have access to Abrupt Decay. So you have access to a certain part of an Abrupt Decay. So it seems like something that could be playable depending on exactly what threats are in the format. Yeah, um, I think the main application we'll end up seeing with this is it's just a way to kill a creature with ward without paying the ward cost like a Rafine. Uh, that's, I think, the main reason. There's Planeswalkers are already probably the worst they've ever been in Magic. They're really bad um, nowadays. Um, so I think it's mostly just like it gets around ward. And in specific, like blue-white control, all the Planeswalkers cost four and up. So yeah, this doesn't right. go there. And because it's yep. only creatures and walkers, it doesn't hit temp lockdown. So you really want, mm -hmm. like mostly in a deck that either the creatures have ward or it's like spirits where they can counter your stuff, but spirits is not getting yep. played right now either. Yep. This is more one of those cards where it's just like, keep this in mind if there's ever probably Pioneer where there's a deck that you want this against. Yeah, possible in standard because hitting Rafine matters oh. and it, you can hit it on the draw on turn two. By the way, did you see that on this card, it specifically in the reminder text says this this spell can't be countered, parentheses, yeah. this includes the ward ability. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this is the first time I've ever seen them specifically call out an ability on something that's not related. I, I think it's good because people miss that all the time, which I think is funny. Um, but the, the amount of times where my opponent casts a rending volley on my Amalia and then pays the life is... Uh, Probably more than the games where they don't, so. So next, we've got Outrageous Robbery, X Black Black Instant. Target opponent exiles the top X cards of their library face down. You may look at and play those cards for as long as they remain exiled. If you cast a spell this way, you may spend mana as though it were mana of any type to cast it. So this is a card you added. So what did you want to discuss about it? So I'm not sure long term where this fits. Um, and it's not quite as good as, say, Siphon Insight because that has... Uh, flashback so it's better against counter spells but i was playing this in blue black control in pioneer um and for like you know like the rap does matchup and stuff uh, which is typically pretty poor control decks oh uh yeah i mean i'm playing this in blue black for like rakdos and stuff um because like you just get to take a bunch of their cards uh, but i'm not sure where it ends up settling into the format um because it is kind of mana intensive so I think we've seen, there's a lot of these cards that are like X and two mana that, and yeah. you, you know, draw X cards or, you know, do something else that's equivalent to drawing X cards. And I think just all of those are not at a power level that where they work anymore. Yeah, because games are not about Sphinx's revelation anymore. Um, I think what makes this a little bit different is the control decks in Pioneer, when you play up against like Rakdos mid, they run you out of resources so fast. And then you also don't have a way to turn the corner really quickly. So taking their cards is like a way to do that. Also, it should be noted that the cards are exiled face down so they can't get thought seized. Yes. Yep. Yep. And then... And that's it, mostly blue black. Moving to the next card, we've got Snarling Gorehound. This is a single black mana 1-1 one, one dog creature with menace. And it says, whenever another creature with power two or less enters the battlefield under your control, surveil one. So almost the same text as DRC, but it triggers on power two or less creatures entering. Also, it doesn't become three power, but is this the black DRC or is it close enough to it that it can see playing Pioneer? Um, I think, unfortunately, this card is a miss. Um, I would like it if it was a little bit better, but it just, yeah, it never really grows. The decks that tend to want to be utilizing the surveil um, off of it, um, you tend not to play it in the aggro decks. It tends to be more of like the graveyard decks and they don't really value the body very much and so it's this weird like case of like it doesn't quite enable enough you don't have quite enough creatures like people were going to try it in amalia but amalia is trying to move away from the graveyard stuff and it, you don't play enough creatures in grease fang to really enable it so i'm not really sure like what a good home for it is um, so there's the new insidious kind of... roots deck but i've seen multiple iterations of that and none of them play it yes yeah like 
Yeah, it, exactly. Stuff like that where people are like, oh, well, maybe it goes in this. And I think, unfortunately, that's kind of where this card is going to be. Um, so I think there's just not a way to trigger it consistently enough. Yep. Yep. And, and if you're playing this, you could just play Stitcher Supplier and just hit three cards immediately rather than having to wait. And, and they've given us other creatures that are one drops that also mill cards as well. So. so next, we've got Toxin Analysis. This is a single black mana instant, and it says target creature gains death touch and lifelink until end of turn and investigate. So this is on here because we have seen plenty of one mana black instants that grant death touch, but this is the first one that investigates. So obviously where we've seen this before is with Goblin Chain Whirler and Touch of Moon Glove, I believe is the card. Yes. But this is basically just a strict upgrade to that in that it also adds lifelink and most importantly, the investigate. So it will eventually replace itself. Also extremely notable for Popper because two of the sweeper effects that are very played in Popper are Crypt Rats and Quark Clan Shaman, which both deal damage. Yes. And I mean, I don't really have anything else to say about it beyond that, unless you wanted to add something. Nope, nope, <laughs> that's it. If you were already in the interest of doing the Chain Whirler thing, this is an upgrade to Touch of Moon Glove, and consider it for your Popper deck that's running Cart Clan or Crypt Rats. All right, so moving on to red cards. Case of the Burning Masks is a three mana red enchantment, double red pips. When it enters the battlefield, deal three damage to target creature and opponent controls. To solve, three or more sources you controlled dealt damage this turn. And then once solved, sack the case, exile the top three cards of your library, choose one of them. You may play that card this turn. So ETB, deal three damage to an opposing creature. Solve it by dealing th damage, any amount of damage from three different sources. And then finally, you can sack it to impulse draw the top three cards of your deck, but you only get one of them. I personally don't think this card is good enough to see play, but what do you think? Yeah, I don't think it is either. Um, I don't think three damage is like quite enough for three mana um, to make it worth it. It's a little bit difficult to actually reach the condition to solve it for a pretty mediocre um, mediocre effect. I think playing the red case is a little bit better if you are an aggressive red deck looking to utilize it. But maybe maybe there's some kind of shell that wants specifically this. Maybe like Pia in some capacity. Uh, but I will note that the, that the sources for the damage, it can be damage of any kind. It can even be like combat damage to other creatures. You don't have to hit them. Yeah, I mean, it, it counts as one source, right? So you only have to deal two more on, on the turn that you play it to solve it, so... Yes. So you can just go like, play this, trigger, kill something, attack with two creatures, solve. Yeah. So something I think that maybe it can slot in is Eidolon. If you cast this with Eidolon, Eidolon deals two damage to you. Um, so like... Well, that wouldn't count because it would do it on the stack. No, no, no. Because case checks um, the, the solve as long as three or more sources you control. Oh, gotcha. So it, it would count. Yeah. As long as you don't have like... But that only comes up in the games where you don't have an attack with Eidolon, even with this being cast. So not a ton of games, but it can be something that's relevant. I think the main sticking point is that three mana for three damage is not that good. Yeah, yes. If it was four, I think this card would be quite good. Mm -hmm. So moving on, we've got another red case. The case of the Crimson Pulse. This is a three mana enchantment. When it enters the battlefield, discard a card, then draw two cards. To solve it, you have no cards in your hand. Very difficult to accomplish in mono red burn. And then finally, once solved, at the beginning of your upkeep, discard your hand, then draw two cards. So kind of, we've seen this kind of effect before. There's lots of red enchantments that are like, if you have no cards in hand, then you can draw more cards. This is more mana, but it gets to rummage when you play it. So what do you think? Yeah, I think this one's really good. Um, so notably, what's a little bit different about this is um, it's a case that makes it harder to meet its own condition, but that doesn't make it worse because you discard one card, when you play it to draw two. So like, unlike some of the rummage effects, it doesn't put you down on cards. Um, so like you get to develop it for free and get the free card selection. Um, but I, I think it's good because most red decks, I think in Pioneer and Standard, they don't really have a hard time going empty handed. And oftentimes I think Magic players are worried about going empty handed when I think more people should be playing out their lands, especially in, in the modern era of Magic. You can use all of your mana every turn like pretty reasonably. Um, so like obviously burn, mono red aggro. I think there's even world, a world in which Phoenix would play some number of this card if like go blank was more popular. Um, like, uh, I could see a world in which like some of the aggro decks like Convoke or whatever end up like wanting like this transitional sideboard plan. Um, I, I think this card's really good. Uh, you can still blink it with Yorian, which may come up if, you, if Enigmatic ever picks up this card. 
uh, stuff like that. So, I think the main place this goes is just like red burn decks. You have a bunch yeah, of cheap I mean, spells, the... you want to empty your hand super fast. This helps you do that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, something too I've noticed about, say, the blue, red, and soul artifact deck in Pioneer um, is that deck runs out of cards incredibly fast and just kind of has to hope the top of its deck cooperates. And I can see this in that capacity. That deck doesn't operate from your resources very well. Uh, so I'll do this. All right, moving on. We've got Crime Novelist, the card that was the most expensive uncommon in the set during the previews. It's a three mana, one three creature goblin bard. Whenever you sack an artifact, put a plus one counter on Crime Novelist and add a red. So notably, all of your treasures get to add an additional red mana. And in particular, this has an infinite combo with animation module. So if you've got animation module and any sack outlet that you can sack stuff for free, you go, uh, you have some artifact in play that is an animation module. You use your sack outlet to sack the artifact, triggering the uh, crime novelist to put a plus one counter on itself and adding a red mana. By putting the plus one counter on itself, you trigger the animation module. So the animation module goes off. You have a red mana floating from the crime novelist trigger. You use that to pay for animation module. You create a servo. You sack the servo to your sack outlet. It triggers the crime novelist ad infinitum. You generate uh, infinite plus one counters on the crime novelist. So, uh, I mean, this combo people are aware of, although I, it appears not to be consistent enough, or at least there's not a shell for it that exists in Pioneer currently, but the effect is definitely powerful and it does have a combo. So what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think it's mostly at the moment just a something to look for rather than this is really good. Um, Pioneer does have a lot of different sack outlets that provide small marginal loops, like yeah, Woe Strider scrying one. The loop itself, self-contained, yeah, the crime novelist does get like, you know, infinite power and toughness. There's cards like Mayhem Devil and stuff. So there's there's definitely like you can do it. Um, but no one has really like put forth like a good shell yet. Um, and that's like the main the main thing is is what else does your deck do beyond that? I don't know. But I think it's mostly just something to to look out for. The main things are like, what is your crime novelist doing when you don't have animation module? What is the animation module doing when you don't have crime novelist? Yes. Something I saw someone suggesting was you can play crime novelist with, say, um, like blood tokens and only cult anvil treasures stuff. and clues yeah. and food. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. By the way, can I just say as an aside, what is this obsession that Wizards has with putting every dinky little artifact token that sacks for an effect on everything it's just completely out of hand at this point i love it i love it i i like these things <laughs> i like blood tokens and clue tokens i don't like treasures but i like blood clue food you know i like those things map tokens i i, I like those so all right i just wish uh, there was a little more counterplay to them like i think they got map tokens done really well because it's sorcery speed um so you have windows to blow them up as well sometimes, so. Well, one of the things I dislike about them is that it's also created this situation where you, ha you used to have cards like Shrapnel Blast, where, you know, you have a cost of sacking artifacts and that used to be an actual cost. And now you've got so many dinky little irrelevant tokens lying around that it doesn't cost you anything. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the real cost of a card like uh, Voldar and Epicure is that it gives you a 1-1, one -one. <laughs> you know? You're playing it for the artifact and it gives you a 1-1, one -one. yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I like the token generation. Um, I really like those mechanics. But yeah, it does mean cards like Shrapnel Blast, like, were designed around having to sacrifice an actual card. And that's becoming less and less the case. All right, so moving on, we've got Demand Answers. This is a two mana red instant. And it says, as an additional cost to cast this spell, sack an artifact or discard a card, draw two cards. So the reason this is here... Uh, this is a variant of like Tormenting Voice. We've seen this card in red a million times. This is the best version of it so far because you can also just sack an artifact instead of discarding, which as I just discussed, is not anywhere near as bad of a cost as discarding because you usually have a bunch of dinky artifacts lying around that you can sack. I still don't think that necessarily even makes this card good enough to see play in most 1v1 formats, but where this is good is it's a common and therefore popper legal. And in popper, we have a ton of decks that are built around Deadly Dispute Reckoner's Bargain and Fanatical Offering. And this is the first card that we have that is red, that does the same thing. So I think in terms of the actual effect, Demand Answers is worse than any of those black cards. But if you are a deck that wanted an effect like this, but you didn't have access to black, which is the case for a lot of decks like Boros Synthesizer, for example, this gives you the first card that you can actually play in those decks. Yep, yep. So you can sack your Lembus, your Iker Wellsprings, your... 
uh, synthesizers, and you just have another card that draws you more cards. Now, it might conflict because red already has access to eight impulse draw effects in Ren's Resolve and Reckless Impulse. So I don't know if it's necessarily better than any of those, but it is another option in red to draw cards. Yeah, that kind of sums up my thoughts on it for like Pioneer as well. Um, you know, these t effects are typically gate kept by other colors. Red doesn't really get access to that very much, and maybe that's enough for it to see play. So, so moving off of demand answers, we've got Fugitive Codebreaker. This is a two mana two one creature goblin and rogue. It has prowess and haste, and then it has a disguise cost of six, including a red pip, but the cost is reduced by one for each instant and sorcery in your graveyard. And when you turn it face up, you can discard your hand and draw three cards. So this card doesn't seem great to me, but it does seem like a potential inclusion in like red prowess or burn decks that are in Pioneer because it's a reasonable stat for its cost. You know, you're probably going to play a spell once a turn in those decks and get prowess. So it's like a two mana three, two with haste. And then if it's later in the game, you can just more flip it and then get another three cards. Yeah, uh, I think this card is really good. I think the Pioneer Red players who are playing Vaishino Pyromancer and not this should be shot, um, you know, or at least they should play a game more of their speed, like, I don't know, Patty Cake or something like that. Uh, this card is really, really good in Pioneer. Um, there is actually one deck that fi that is 5-0'd with it, and it's actually a Hearth Elemental Rakdos deck where you play, like, Thought Seas and stuff. But, um... We already have seen a big uptick in like Lightning Helix burn decks, just like, you know, red aggro decks in general. And I have yet to see any of them play this, and I don't really understand why. Uh, two minute, two one prowess haste is like pretty good um, when you're playing like play with fires and stuff like that. Like, uh, and then once it's later in the game, as long as you have a sufficient number of burn spells in your deck, it's just basically four mana, cast, flip, yep. redraw three cards. Yep, yep. Yeah, like. You know, I, I, I think this card should be seeing way more play than it currently is. Also, it's a goblin, but don't play it in goblins. Play it in burn. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So moving on, we have Galvanize. This is a two mana red instant, and it says it deals three to target creature. But if you've drawn two or more cards this turn, it deals five damage to the creature instead. So Dylan, as the resident Phoenix expert. Yeah. Um, I was playing it uh, early on, but... I don't really like it very much anymore, but that's mostly because um, it doesn't hit Planeswalkers. So you can't hit its fairy with it. And there's not a ton of Shouldreds at the moment. So there's not really any anything that's like five toughness. Thing. I guess the main thing I would ask in this case is like, how does this compare to Roast, for example? Because presumably you're playing this because you need to hit something that has five toughness. Um, yeah, I think this is much better because instant speed three damage is totally acceptable and a good fail case. Um, you can still hit an Amalia, you can hit a Grease Fang, um, you can hit a Manland with it. Um, so I do think I do think it's better than most of, the, most of the other five damage options that we've seen, but I don't think you really need to kill five toughness creatures right now. Is this also pretty much just always going to be a sideboard card? Yes, yes. Okay, so moving on, we've got Cranko, Baron of Tin Street. This is a three mana, three, three haste legendary goblin. It has tap, sack an artifact, put a plus one counter on each goblin you control. And whenever an artifact is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, you may pay red. If you do, you create a 1-1 one, one red goblin creature token. It gains haste until end of turn. So 3 mana 3-3 three, three haste is an acceptable stat line for how much that costs. And then it has the ability to be a lord for your goblins, although you do need artifacts. I don't know how many artifacts are in goblin decks. Off the top of my head, I can't think of like any, but it also doesn't, I guess, that doesn't necessarily need to be in a goblin deck because it does create its own army so you could play it in some sort of artifact deck i doubt in soul but it is an option there what do you think yeah i mean for a card that does a lot of different things and has a lot of text on it i don't really think it has a good home in pioneer um or in standard like it feels like it should um it feels it would feel weird for this card to like not see any play but i just think that like yeah there's not very many you can't free roll artifacts if you're playing a bunch of goblins so it kind of has to be like a standalone engine type card that you're playing um it's already weird that we're at a point in pioneer where goblin rabble master is basically unplayable um so I, i'm and i'm not sure that this is actually like i think this is a little better but not like substantially so so i'm not really sure um where this would fit uh, notably it does pump itself when you sack the artifact but it also pumps the token because you make the token before getting the counter. 
Yes. Um, so yeah, I'm not really sure where this uh, should fit. Uh, and like, Goblins doesn't want to play it because, yeah, you don't have any artifacts in that deck. It's weird that uh, the Goblins cards don't really make <laughs> artifact tokens um, in Pioneer. Um, and Vampires make more, so... <laughs> So it's basically, our verdict is a card that's good, but there's no shell for it. Yes. Okay. So next up, Cranko's Buzz Crusher. This is a four mana, four, four artifact creature, insect opter, double red pips. It has flying and trample. And it says when it enters the battlefield for each player, destroy up to one non-basic land that player controls. For each land destroyed this way, its controller may search their library for a basic land, put it onto the battlefield, tap, and then shuffle. So the reason I have this on the list is because I think this card is not good, but I've seen a lot of players say, oh my god, it doesn't target, therefore you can destroy Lotus Field with it. And I have to say, if your answer to Lotus Field is trying to resolve a four mana creature before they combo off that will blow up their Lotus Field, I do not think that's an avenue to success. But what do you think? Um, I think, I think people are wrong and right about this card. So... I have played it. I currently play one in Arclight, and it's fine. I probably wouldn't cut it. Um, it is not enough on its own to beat Lotus Field, but there's no card in Magic that is, so I don't think that's really knocked against it. I think the important thing is uh, most decks don't have the ability to play this to blow up a Lotus Field because Lotus Field just killed them. But I think an exception to that is like Arclight, where you have all the counter spells. Um, where you get a lot of windows to blow up Lotus Field when you're playing Arclight Phoenix with this. And oftentimes with Arclight, you only need one turn, usually. Um, when you put a threat into play uh, and and blow up their Lotus Field, you're going to kill them on the next turn. So you so if Krenko's Buzz Crush, if the turn that it gives you uh, is enough to kill them, then that's fine. Um, better Lotus Field players are just going to start playing their Lotus Field later on the turn they can combo. Um, so it isn't always like a catch-all. Where I think a different application for this is, um, I think you need to have a reason to play it beyond Lotus Field. And for me, um, you can play it with Fable the Mirror Breaker, and you can actually lock people out of the game, given enough time. Um, but the other avenue is, in Pioneer specifically, Manlands Matter. And so in the Phoenix deck, you can use it to blow up like a Hive of the Eye of Tyrant. Um, or Hall of Storm Giants, or yeah, Lair of the Hydra. Yes, something I actually have done multiple times is blow up a mountain that had Chain to the Rocks on it. Because in Pioneer, uh, you don't play enough basic mountains in the Chain to the Rocks decks. You're always enchanting a non-basic. And so you can just blow it up and get your card back with Chain to the Rocks. So if you are a deck that cares about Chain to the Rocks and Lotus Field and Manlands, I think playing one is fine. Um, but it's not going to be like win the game type card. So it's a very, very niche sideboard card. Yeah, yeah, and I do, I do think one is pretty solid in a lot of red creature decks in Pioneer, but um, you can't really like rely on it uh, that way. So. so as long as we've got Lotus Field brought up right now, can we just reiterate, for people who are trying to beat Lotus Field, if your answers to Lotus Field in your sideboard are permanents like Alpine Moon and Damping Sphere, stop it. Yes. You, you cannot beat Lotus yep. Field with permanents. They will just bounce or blow them up and win anyway. Yes, yep, you have to attack them. You must kill them or have counter spells and a lot of them. Yeah, and sometimes they play silence anyway, so. So next up, this is our final red card. We have Pyrotechnic Performer. This is a two mana red 3-2 creature. It has disguise for a single red mana and it is when you turn it or any other creature face up, that creature deals damage equal to its power to each opponent. So this seems like an obvious, it's another mana red aggro slash burn card. A two mana three two is an acceptable stat line, and then later in the game you can more flip it for four mana and deal three immediately. Have yeah. I pretty much summed it up? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think like um, we've kind of there's been a few different disguise cards that are like playable, but um, you know, not like you know fantastic. But like if you play enough of them, this card also can like scale off those as well. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a card mostly look out for for standard. So, all right. So moving on to green. Our first green card is Aftermath Analyst. This is a two mana, one three creature elf. When it enters the battlefield, you mill three cards and you can pay four mana and sacrifice it to return all the lands from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped. So there's two aspects to this card. One, it is yet another in a very long line of two mana creatures that when it enters, it mills some amount of cards, usually three or four. 
like Seder Wayfinder, Blanchwood Prowler, etc. And this has an activated ability that is the same thing as Splendid Reclamation. We have seen occasional attempts at making Splendid Reclamation combo decks, which have mostly not been very good and don't really see much play, but this is... Although technically, if you're trying to do Splendid Reclamation, then this is more mana overall, but it is also just a creature that you can play on turn two, mill some stuff to also potentially enable the four mana activated ability. It's a one three, so it can block some stuff. So not strictly better than Splendid Reclamation, but like generally gonna be better than it. I, I, I think the other thing too is um, currently in the Pioneer Splendid Reclamation deck, they are green black uh, most of the time. Um, and because Aftermath Analyst is a creature, you can still do it as part of the loop where you don't need Mystic Sanctuary anymore. You can just use uh, Witch's Cottage uh, and set it up that way. So it still does let you loop in the Pioneer deck. You just need more mana. Um, um, but So yeah, I haven't I mean, actually, I have not actually seen the Splendid Reclamation combo deck. I just know that it exists. It's not, but from what I understand, it's not very good, right? It's fine. Yeah, it's, it's not very good. Um, I actually think it's, so it's a spelunking deck that uses Beseech. Um, they play one Splendid as a Beseech target when they're uh, comboing and stuff. I think it's actually like overall just worse than playing like the red green world tree versions. Um, but like, uh, it's basically impossible to play that deck on Magic Online because the mana clicks. The world tree one already takes like a bunch, but the Splendid Reclamation one takes like forever um, to do it. So that could, you know, so, but it's not very good. Aftermath Analyst is a nice, little boost to that deck um but i'm not sure that it's uh that it's enough i think the surveil lands are also a pretty big boost to the splendid reclamation decks as well. so next we've got analyze the pollen so this is a single green mana sorcery as an additional cost to cast this you may collect evidence eight search your library for a basic land but if you collected evidence instead search your library for a creature or any land reveal the card put it into your hand so for a green mana you go get a basic into your hand but if you pay evidence eight, so exile mana value eight from your graveyard, then you get to search for any creature or any land, regardless of whether it's basic. So obviously the card that it's closest to is Traverse the Olvenwald. So in this case, the condition is rather than needing delirium, you need to get enough mana value to evidence collect. Yep. So what is your thought process here? Or like, what's your analysis? Is this is it easier to get the evidence eight collected than it is delirium, basically? Yes. Uh, I don't think it's particularly close. And I think this is probably the best variant we've seen of this. Um, and it should be going into more Pioneer decks than it currently is, and possibly some standard. Uh, currently, the main deck that plays this in Pioneer is actually Niv to Light. Uh, you play a lot of expensive cards, uh, you've got some board wipes, and you can just tutor for a Niv, um, which is just going to find you more cards. Also, you're always interested um, in hitting your land drops every turn. Yes, yes. Um, other decks where it could be a consideration, and I've thought about playing it before, is Grease Fang and Amalia, um, where again, you have a, a linchpin creature. You're very happy to cheat it, to, to tutor for for one mana. And they're, in Grease Fang in particular, usually you have excess cards you can exile from your graveyard. If you ever have two Parhelions, usually you can, do, you can uh, exile one, and that's fine. Um, but even like uh, a bunch of other creatures and stuff, um, though I haven't really seen very many, that deck also doesn't have a problem in neighbor enabling Traverse, so I'm not really sure. Um, but yeah, it's mostly Niv at the moment, but I think more decks should incorporate this. Card. What about older formats where potentially Traver where Delirium might be a lot easier because of Fetch Lands and Mishra's Bobble and whatnot? I think it just like pretend depends on uh, the particulars because like, um, yeah, like Mishra's Bobble and Fetch Lands, yes. Um, you know, like for example, like if you were just like, if you were to look at Modern's past and be like, well, and offer a Jund Death Shadow player, would you rather play Analyze the Pollen or uh, Traverse? They're going to take Traverse every time. I think it, I think it just depends on how easy it is to get uh, uh, Collect Evidence 8. And for the decks that are playing, like, that probably want tra a Traverse type effect, probably play a much lower curve. Um, so, like, there's the Lord of the Ring Land Cyclers, you can, and if you're playing a deck that's milling yourself over or whatever, oh. you, you can have, like, Merc Tide or something, but I think in general it's probably easier to Traverse. I think so. I think, yeah, I think the only real exception would be, like, yeah, if you're playing a, a Troll of Cause of Doom deck, like, it's pretty easy then to do it, um, but I'm not really sure what decks are really in the market for that, so... Because usually all the land cycling decks are like Cascade where you can't play this and don't yeah. and wouldn't want to even if you could. Right. And then the other one too is like, I know in Legacy uh, for a bit, I was playing the uh, Troll of Cause of Doom reanimate Delver deck. And like, even if you were playing a deck like that, that had an Analyze the Pollen, there's nothing really you want to search for. Like it's not really worth a deck slot. So. All right. So overall, 
analysis, good card, pretty similar to Traverse. If you are a deck that wanted to maybe play Traverse or would have wanted to play Traverse but couldn't get the Delirium on it before, this is a consideration. And it entirely depends on, can you get the evidence to collect in your deck? Yeah. So moving on, we've got Archdruid's Charm. This is a triple green instant. And it says, choose one of three modes, but it's secretly four modes, but it's three modes. Search your library for a creature or land and reveal it. Put it onto the battlefield tapped if it's a land, otherwise put it into your hand. Or put a plus one counter on target creature you control. It deals damage equal to its power to target creature you don't control. And then finally, exile target artifact or enchantment. So it seems like primarily you're gonna be playing this if you're interested in the first mode. And we've already seen this become a staple in Lotus Field as a way to just instant speed Lotus Field into play. And it is also showing up in uh, Resurgences of Monogreen Devotion. Yes. Um, yeah, there's a couple other decks that play it, but none of them have 5 0 yet. Um, for example, Gruel Vehicles deck in Pioneer um, plays a couple copies uh, as a supplement to like Huntsman and stuff, but that deck is like kind of bad right now. Um, but it is really nice in that deck. Um, I've actually played it in Amalia, and it was it was fine. It was pretty solid. Um, but yeah, it, it's really good in the mono green deck currently. Um, and the main version that really abuses Archdruid's Charm um, doesn't play Cavalier. So you tutor out um, either Garenbrig or Nykthos or Lair of the Hydra, and you can you play like a Wake Root Elemental, uh, and you can like generate infinite mana that way and make like a really fucking big uh, uh, Lair of the Hydra. And stuff but you also have like titan of industry hornet queen stuff like that so like um i think actually the best deck for this is is lotus field but i've been seeing because it just lets them have yeah. even more consistency at finding their lotus field and now it means that they're whereas like sylvan scrying could only find lotus field now the arch druids charm can find leer or other big payoff mm -hmm. creatures yeah or like a dragon lord dromoka sometimes post boards a comma yeah it also means they can instant speed lotus field out past potential answers to it uh of note uh there is actually a really cool thing you can do but i haven't seen anyone do it yet um though i think they should and that is you should be playing a pit of offerings when you're playing this card so that's the land that is like the pioneer equivalent of bajuka bog basically yes. Yes. phoenix is incredibly powerful and one of the most popular decks in the format um and I guarantee you, <laughs> you will win more matches against them by Archdruids Charming for a Pit of Offerings against them. Um, so I haven't seen anyone do that yet, but I think they should. Uh, I was playing it in um, the World Tree deck, which I also think uh, the Scapeshift World Tree Spelunking decks also want to play this card. Um, but I, I think more decks should be looking at playing a Pit of Offerings currently if you're playing Arch Druid's Charm, so. So moving on, we've got Audience with Tristani. So this is a three mana green sorcery, and it says you create a zero one green plant creature token and then draw cards equal to the number of differently named creature tokens you control. So at worst, this is three mana, make a zero one token, draw a card. But if you've got more other types of tokens, then you get to draw more cards. So this is a card you added to the list. So why did you want to add it? So the reason I added it, um, we saw it about last set. There was a deck that 5 0 that was just green-white tokens. Um, I played it for a little bit. It was, it was pretty good. But we have had Battle for Bredegard decks be playable in Pioneer before. And this is kind of like more redundancy with that type of uh, archetype. Um, so I do think it is like playable in those kinds of decks. We have things like Legion's Landing and uh, stuff like that to make a bunch of differently named uh, tokens. Um, so I think like in a deck that wants to play this or Battle for Bredegard, you can probably draw like three to five cards off of this on turn three or four. <clears throat> well, probably turn four for like five cards. But For those unfamiliar, yeah, Battle for Bredegard is a three mana green and white enchantment saga from, uh, what was the, from the Cal Norse Hyde. set, Kaldheim. Uh, chapter one, make a one, one human. Chapter two, make a one, one elf warrior. Chapter three, choose any number of target uh, any number of artifact tokens and or creature tokens you control with different names and for each of them create a copy of it yep yep yeah so that was a deck for a little bit in pioneer and you played seekus chariot and gideon ally of zendikar and stuff so um, so if that deck ever comes back i think they'll play four audience which we're starting all right so moving on chalk outline so this is a four mana green enchantment and it says, whenever one or more creature cards leave your graveyard, create a 2-2 white and blue detective creature token, then investigate. So make a 2-2 creature and a clue. So specifically, we have seen this get played in the new Insidious Roots deck, and it is part of an infinite combo. 
So if you've got Chalk Outline, Oval Chase, Daredevil, and then a Discard Outlet, the one that people are playing right now is Lotlith Troll, but it doesn't have to be Lotlith Troll. It just has to be any Discard Outlet. So first, you need to get Oval Chase into your graveyard, and then you need to either have a creature leave your graveyard in some way, or put an artifact into place somehow so that Oval Chase will come back to your hand. Regardless, when, they get, when you get the trigger, so let's say you let's say you have a creature leave your graveyard, right? So chalk outline triggers. It puts a clue into play. This triggers the oval chase daredevil. The oval chase daredevil comes back to your hand. Then the oval chase daredevil has left the graveyard, so it triggers chalk outline. Then with the chalk outline trigger on the stack, you hold priority and you discard the oval chase daredevil to your discard outlet. The oval chase daredevil goes back to your graveyard. You resolve the chalk outline ability. You create a two two and a clue. The clue entering triggers the oval chase. The oval chase comes back to your hand. It triggers the chalk outline, you hold priority, you discard the oval chase, etc. You get infinite two twos and infinite clues. And in the case of Lotlith Troll, the Lotlith Troll becomes infinite power. Uh, it's a little awkward because you have to play a four mana enchantment that doesn't do anything the turn you play it, unless you already have the entire combo set up. But other than that, it is an inclusion, at least in the Insidious Roots deck, for having an infinite combo that will generate infinite power on the board, regardless of whether your discard outlet is Lotlith Troll and give you infinite clue tokens. So for example, even if you, like, let's say you make the infinite uh, two twos and then your opponent board wipes, so you still have infinite clues. You can just keep drawing off of all of your excess mana. You can also do it at instant speed. So you can go like end of opponent's turn, do it at instant speed, make a bunch of two twos on tap, attack them. Or if you already had Lot with Troll in play, you can just do it, attack with Lot with Troll. It's an infinite power trampler. Do you have anything to add to that? Mm, not really. I mean, yeah, this, this is a may not be tier one or anything at the moment, but you know, it is a deck that like will probably exist forever in Pioneer now in some capacity. Um, yeah, it's a four mana enchantment, but like there's ways to find it. There's like some degree of value redundancy with Insidious Roots and stuff like, yeah, I mean, you know. So. Also, even if you don't have the infinite combo, if you just have a sufficient number of ways to have creatures leave your graveyard, you can just for free, essentially, generate a 2-2 yes. and a clue every turn for however many times you can get creatures to leave. Yeah, so something that you, for example, that like uh, I was doing in one of the early drafts is I was just playing one copy of the Mirax because it just makes an artifact to trigger Oval Chase to like either start the loop or you can get Oval Chase chains and stuff. So yeah, I have seen I've it. seen Mirax as like a one or two of in a bunch of lists as yeah. well just for this combo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's a good one of Mirax is just a good card in general. There's also just a bunch of cards that leave the graveyard, especially in this set has a bunch of leave the graveyard yes. abilities that are relevant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, so moving on from Chalk Outline. Flourishing Bloomkin is a two mana green creature. It's a zero zero, but it gets plus one for each forest you control. And then this is yet another disguise creature. So the disguise cost is five. When you turn it face up, search your library for up to two forests and reveal them, put one of them onto the battlefield tapped and the other into your hand. It's also, uh, they don't have to be basic forests. They can be dual forests. So this is another card you added. Why did you want to talk about Flourishing Bloomkin? Uh, it's going to be very quick. The only reason is uh, I have seen a standard deck that is just mono green stompy ish, and you play this um, because it's like a two mana, like three, three, and then four, four, and then five, five, and stuff. So that's it, really, just standard. If uh, there's a mono green, like mid range aggro deck, like this card is probably a part of it. So, well, speaking of standard green cards, our next card is yet another card you added to the list Hard Hitting Question. Green sorcery, target creature you control deals damage equal to its power to target creature or planeswalker you don't control. So, We've seen a million variants of this, you know, your guy fights a dude, sometimes asymmetrically, including at one mana. So what is differentiating hard-hitting question from those cards that you wanted to discuss it? Uh, it is a one mana fight spell that doesn't fight. So... And also it's walkers. Yeah, and it can hit planeswalkers. So, so basically it's the best version of this effect we've seen so far? Yes, it is sorcery, but it's the cheapest, most efficient version that we've seen. So, yep. All right. Moving on, we've got Pick Your Poison. This is a one mana green sorcery, and it says choose one. Each opponent sacks an artifact, or they sack an enchantment, or they sack a creature with flying. I've seen a bunch of people be super excited about this as a sideboard card, and I will say that it looks like an okay sideboard card, not anything great. So am I undervaluing it, or is it just what I think it is, an okay sideboard card? Um, I think you're, I think, I think it depends on the format. Um, Pioneer currently, I think it's fine. Um, I think there's some decks that probably want to play it. Uh, I think it's more for uh, modern um, and standard currently, because in standard you can pick off a Rafine with it. Um, you can hit a wedding announcement. There's there's a lot of things to hit with it, uh, leyline bindings. 
But in modern, if your opponent does the stupid ley line into Draco curve, you can hit either one of those, basically, of your choice with it. So it is actually really good in modern currently, um, and in legacy as well. Um, uh, but uh, maybe you pop her in some capacity. But I think Pioneer is kind of like little weak for these kinds of sideboard cards in general. So Popper in particular, so one of the biggest cards in Popper is All That Glitters. Yes. And this is not the only way to hit that for one mana, but it is a way to hit that for one mana in a way that also hits other things. Also, uh, sometimes those decks will like put in All That Glitters on an Ornithopter so you can make them stack the Ornithopter and then they lose both. Also, uh, indestructible artifact tap lands from Modern Horizons are a bunch of lands that see play in Popper. So if their turn one is just like play a tap land and then you untap, you have a one mana way of killing it. Yep, yep. Primarily for Popper, I would think this would just mostly be used to kill all that glitters though. Cause the fact that they have, the fact that it's, they choose which one to sack means that it's not gonna be great for hitting artifacts. And flying creatures are not really even that big of a deal in Popper either. They're mostly small crappy creatures. Yeah, a lot, a lot of like one ones and stuff, yeah. Used to be different in the, in the days of like um, uh, Spire Golem and Delver of Secrets, you know, where like this type of effect would have been really good, but, uh, but yeah. But I do, I do think this is another card where Pioneer is probably the worst format for it. All right. So sideboard card, your mileage may vary. Yeah. Next up, we've got the Pride of Hullclade. This is an 11 mana, but again, not really, creature. That's a 215 legendary creature, Crocodile Elk Turtle. It costs X less to cast, where X is the total toughness of creatures you control. It has Defender. And then it has an activated ability for two blue blue. Until end of turn, target creature you control gets plus one plus zero and gains whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player, draw cards equal to its toughness and can attack as though it didn't have defender. So I've seen a lot of people be excited about this card. I think mostly well, I think just for the novelty one. value. Well, because it still deals damage based on its power. So it can attack for three, I guess, even though it's mostly you're getting the value off of the dealing damage off of toughness from the ability. Yeah because uh, you want to draw a bajillion cards, which I have actually done. I've drawn 15 with this. And uh, also it can target anything. It doesn't just have to target itself. Yeah, I know. It just seems like such a silly... Uh... <laughs> okay, so I'm not going to argue that this card is good necessarily, right. but I have... Playable. I have... I've built this deck. Yes. Pioneer Big Butts. I this deck. Pioneer Big Butts. So the idea here is that we're just going to play as many cheap creatures that have large toughness and like no power as possible. And yes. then we're going to use cards like Assault Formation, Huatli the Sun's Heart, High Alert, Arcades, whatever these, any of these cards that either are, say like allow a defender to attack or uh, creatures deal damage based on their toughness. And then we're just going to be an aggro deck that aggros people with with butts. Yeah, I've, I've played against this deck. There's someone who plays the blue green version on Moto and I've played against them. Uh, one of the versions I actually drew up was actually uh, playing white um because you can get some hate creatures if you play white like uh dauntless dismantler and stuff i've been through like multiple versions of this deck this isn't actually the version i'm playing right now and yeah it's kind of like awkward i think one of the big issues with it is that the cards are mostly in the simic colors and it's a little awkward if you want to play all three colors because so hawatli is green and white so that doesn't commit you to specifically being in like certain colors but there's the thing about the deck is like you want to have green because you want to play Pride of Whole Clade. Yes. And then if you but then the problem is like if you want to play high alert, then that necessitates that you're in three different colors, which makes your mono a lot worse. Uh, and if you're specifically in green and blue, then you don't really have good answers to permanents that have resolved uh -huh. because all you yeah, have is like I bounce effects. Um, the yeah, I, I do have a, I do have a Bant version yeah. that I'm going to try out. Uh, and then specifically, another thing with it is like there's a lot of defender creatures as well, but the only card that actually just straight up allows your defenders to attack is High Alert. Assault Formation, you have to pick green every time you want to make one of your defenders able to attack. There's also Walking Bulwark and Colorless, but you have to pay two mana to make your defender able yep. to attack. I just want to go one drop, two drop, or one drop, one drop, one drop, and then play my thing and then just attack with everything immediately. Yep, yeah, I'm the, I'm the same way when I was building this archetype as well, was like the defenders are a trap. You want to play that core of 12, uh, uh, 12 enablers. Um, yeah, I was playing Bant because I felt like, yeah, blue-green doesn't really give you answers, and, like, you do get some hate creatures as well that you can play with it. Um, like, and so I was playing some of those, so... I absolutely love tower defense in this deck. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, let me pull up the Bant version here, actually. 
So this is the Bant version that I'm going to try out next. And I think one of the big things here is that I tried a whole bunch of different two mana creatures. I had like Fey of Wishes and Reality Chip and a bunch of other things. And I think the main thing you want is you just actually want to treat this like it's an aggro deck and Same. prioritize having high toughness. And I think the big thing is that by being in white, uh, one problem I was encountering was that with only Assault Formation and Hawatli, I sometimes just wouldn't draw my defense card. Yep. So I needed more. So that's what High Alert enables. And it also, being in white gives you access to Giant Ox. And it's very important for Pride of the Hulk Clade's cost reduction. You need to go four toughness into six toughness into Pride for one mana. Yes. And that allows you to go any one drop into e either two drop into Pride for just a single mana. And then that will allow you to go like turn one, one drop, turn two, two drop, turn three, Pride plus Assault Formation attack. Yep. Yeah, the the yeah, similar conditions I was meeting when I was building mine was like if I wasn't playing a creature with like crazy high toughness, it needed to have like a really good sideboard application. Like I was playing Dauntless Dismantler when I was expecting um like uh a cat oven deck on because you know it's a little bit weaker, but it's a side so like Solus Jailer, stuff like that. I looked at a whole bunch of the white stacks creatures and I ultimately decided that I didn't really like any of them, but we'll we'll talk more about this. Like, after the yeah, review it's just magic right you know <laughs> ami is never happy with the magic card so but yeah no i think i think uh pride of the whole plate's definitely very playable um i like the card all right so moving on we've got rubble belt maverick so speaking of one of the many cards that's in the insidious roots deck this is a single green one one creature human when it enters surveil two and then while it's in your graveyard you can pay green and exile it to put a plus one counter on target creature activate only as a sorcery so 1-1 one, one surveils to when it enters, so it helps fix your draws slash put things in the graveyard. And then when it's in your graveyard, you can pay just a single mana to exile it, put a counter on something, and trigger all of your leaves the graveyard triggers, including Insidious Roots. Although, as I've seen the deck develop, it seems like people are not playing Rubble Belt Maverick anymore, but that might just be like the current iterations. But regardless, what do you think? Yeah, um, I don't really think it'll long term like fit that type of archetype very well, but I think there may be other decks that this like fits in, like um, like maybe there's a Grease Fang version that wants to go back to playing more creatures or you know stuff of that nature. Um, it's kind of unique in green, a one drop like milling or and surveil two on a one drop is actually like pretty good. Um, so I'm sure we'll have a home for it, but I, I'm not sure exactly what it'll be. So. All right, so. Next up is Sharp-Eyed Rookie. This is a 2 mana 2 2 creature human with Vigilance. Whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, if its power is greater than Sharp-Eyed Rookie's power or its toughness is greater than Sharp-Eyed Rookie's toughness, put a plus one counter on Sharp-Eyed Rookie and investigate. So basically it has Evolve that also investigates. This is a card you added. So talk about Sharp-Eyed Rookie. Yeah, so uh, this is actually seen playing in Pioneer right now in the Golgari decks, and it's pretty good. Uh, in, in that archetype. Um, we're not sure exactly how many you're supposed to play, um, but it's a nice little redundancy with Mosswood Dread Knight type card. Um, of note, it's also a human, and I think the four color human decks, while they're not, while the couple people who play the four or five color humans are not playing it, I think they should. Um, curves really well into Mantis Rider or Reflector Mage or Adeline, so like I, I think those decks should be playing it. Um, and in standard, you, you can play it in like the mono green, uh, like stompy aggro deck, but, but um, it's not going to like break any format or anything, but it's just like a solid role player in some decks. So. All right. So moving on, we've got Slime Against Humanity, a three mana sorcery. You create a zero zero ooze creature token with trample. You put X plus one counters on it where X is two plus the total number of cards you own in exile and in your graveyard that are oozes or are named Slime Against Humanity, a deck can have any number of cards named Slime Against Humanity. So the first one that you cast of these is a 2-2 two -two with Trample, but if you have more copies of this card or other oozes, I suppose, in your graveyard or exile, then it will get one bigger for every one of those cards. So the only reason I put this on the list is because it's Popper legal and in Popper, there's a lot of ways to mill yourself with like Thought Scour and Mental Note and whatnot. And mm -hmm. There are already decks that do a similar sort of a game plan. So all of the Talarian Terror decks are interested in filling their graveyard up with a whole bunch of spells. So hypothetically, you could make like a blue and green version of this where you just mill over a whole bunch of cards, put a bunch of Slime Against Humanities in your graveyard. And then if you start casting Slime Against Humanities and you make like four, four, five, five tramplers per each one, that could be reasonable. Although the issue that I'm having with it is it feels like it's just a worse plan than just playing Terror. Right. 
That's fun. <laughs> also, why is it called Slime Against Humanity? Like, is, is this a reference to Cards Against Humanity, the card game? Uh, but I this, like, has nothing to do with that in any way? It's just a reference to Crime Against Humanity. Crime Against Humanity? It's yeah. It's just so it's just pun. like an awful pun that makes no sense? All puns are great. I love puns. I, um, I sent Nick this, this, uh, <laughs> Legacy Slime Against Humanity decklist where you play one in the board and you play like Burning Wish and stuff and you play Selective Memory and you just exile a bunch of uh, <laughs> of them, so. <laughs> All right, so moving on, we've got Undergrowth Recon, a three mana green enchantment with two green pips. At the beginning of your upkeep, return target land card from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped. So right away, similar sort of idea as cards like Ramanok Excavator and Crucible of Worlds. The main difference is so obviously you're not playing the land from your graveyard, it's just triggering, which means that uh, you don't have to spend your land drop for the turn getting the land back. However, what it, the land enters tapped, so it also means that uh, when you're playing Ramanop and Crucible to do like Wasteland loops or whatnot, you can't exactly do the same thing with this. So the cards are not exactly the same, they do sort of similar things. It strikes me as a card that would probably be good in like Legacy Lands, but what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think it's probably worse in Legacy Lands than, like, the current options. Um, there may be some applications in some other formats with it, um, but I, I'm always happy to see, like, it's rare that these types of effects don't see some play. Not using a land drop is, like, uh, a pretty unique deviation from the versions we've seen before, and that may be enough for some different, uh, different takes on it, but I'm not sure what the, like, perfect way to kind of break that is, because... Not being able to wasteland is like pretty relevant, um, but and you don't get the value until your next turn, and then it's tapped and stuff, so you can't really use it to like ramp and stuff either. So I'm not really sure like where it'll fit in. It also that. means though that like if your opponent's wastelanding you, you can just keep getting stuff back. Right, right. Um, so yeah, it's it's weird that it's like not using your land drop mostly is like a mitigation measure maybe. So I, I'm I'm not sure, um, but. I'm always happy for them to explore more versions of this type. All right, so moving on. We're going directly into multicolor. We do not have any colorless cards on the list unless you count lands, but it's going to be all the multicolor cards and then lands. So the first one is Onsrog the Quake Mole. It is a four mana gruel legendary creature. It's an eight four, and it says whenever it becomes blocked, untap each creature you control. After this combat phase, there is an additional combat phase and you can pay seven mana, including two red and two green pips to make it, uh, Anzrog must be blocked each combat this turn of Fable. So I've seen a bunch of discussion around making this a commander in EDH. You added it to, you wanted to add it to the list and I assume that's not for EDH purposes. So why did you want to add Anzrog? Yeah, there's a specific card from Konzatark here. Um, I think I know the one you're where, talking about. Yeah, where it's the three mana one. Yeah, uh, I, I roar the challenge. Yeah, Roar of the Challenge, yeah. So that does make a combo with this, um, but... For those who don't know, it basically says your creature becomes unblockable and everything has to block it. So you can just yeah, in, you can just Onsrog, uh, make it indestructible, make it have to be blocked, attack, your opponent has to block it. They block it, this presumably kills the creature because it has eight power. Then you get another combat phase, you attack them again, they have to block it, so it kills all their creatures. Yes, so if you have like a Goblin Rabble Master or like any other creature that can attack, it's probably killing them. Um, so there's that. But the other thing is this- It also untaps the creatures. So if you've got like a pinger that taps, it can, that can kill them too. Yep, yep. Um, but so the other thing is, um, this has actually been seeing some play in the Gruul vehicle stack uh, because- Because it's just a big giant monster for four? It's, it's just a big giant creature. It takes the trample from Huntsman's Redemption very well. Can crew a creature. Um, Gets haste from Reckless Storm. Yeah, so like, yeah, right. You get haste from that on curve. It, you know, it kills pretty quick. You can uh, use a creature to crew a vehicle. And then on the extra combat phase, you also get to attack with that creature. So it just like, and you play mana dorks and stuff. So um, if there ever was a deck that this can be played in, it's probably like that kind of deck. Um, I don't think they're going to be playing it long term at all, um, but it's just like something you can do with it. Also, for anyone curious, I did whip together an EDH deck of this really fast. So <laughs> this is it. Uh, this is all the cards in the 99, and the basic premise here is that, so for Onsrog, you want to set up one of two combos. You either want to make it so that you attack and kill all of your opponent's creatures, or you attack and win the game. So for that combo, you want to do one of two things. Basically, 
the Onsrog is going to keep giving you combat steps, but it doesn't, notably, unlike all of the, like most of the other extra combat step effects, this does not give you an extra main phase. So you have to stay in combat. Also, Onsrog himself doesn't have inherent indestructible or anything like that. So if you're just blocking, or if you're just attacking and having things block it over and over, it will eventually die. Therefore, you want to do a couple of things. You want to have an effect that is cheap, that is either really cheap or something that you just already have on the battlefield when you start attacking, because you don't want to have to pay seven mana to make Onsrog unblockable. And then the second thing you want is either cards that give Onsrog indestructible or that prevent combat damage. So in this deck, you're going to want cards like Fog, for example, or just things that make him indestructible, like I think so. Roar of the Challenge is over here. Uh, there's a bunch of Fog effects, in too, including right? uh, Spore Frog. Sorry, what was that? Maze of Ith works too, right? Uh, no, because you'll have to keep tapping Maze of Ith. You want to keep taking combats over and over. I don't think so. I think Maze of Ith is, a, is the whole turn. Well, you only remove it from combat once, right? And prevent the combat yeah, once? Yeah, but it prevents all damage that we've dealt to and buy it for the rest of the turn. Let's read Maze of Ith. Right. Untap target creature, prevent all combat damage you've dealt to and dealt by that creature this turn. Oh, you're right. Yeah. So yeah, Ma so Maze of Ith would also do that. So in here, uh, this is all laid out just so that it can like appear on the screen. But basically, aside from all of the regular red and green cards that you're going to play in EDH, like Dockside, Extortionist, and whatnot, the other main things you want in here are you want haste. So need for speed, lightning, greaves, etc. Because you want to be able to just attack with Onsrog immediately. You've got forced blocking effects like Irresistible Prey, Lure, so that you don't have to activate Onsrog. And then you've got indestructible effects like Roar of the Challenge, or you've got fog effects like Obscuring Haze, Spore Frog. So here you can do one of two things. Uh, indestructible means you can attack, and indestructible plus lure means you can attack, and then your opponents have to block you, so you just kill every creature in play. If you've got fog, you don't kill every creature in play, but you get to take infinite combats, and then you can combine that with uh, Volshock, Sorcerer, Cunning, Spark Mage, Goblin Fire, Slinger, any of these tap to ping someone effects because Onsrog will keep on tapping them and so you just take infinite combats you keep attacking the same thing that you fogged and then you keep pinging them over and over and so that's just a quick like way to build Onsrog. All right moving on from EDH blood spatter analysis this is a two mana Rakdos enchantment when it enters the battlefield it deals three damage target creature and opponent controls and whenever one or more creatures die on either side mill a card and put a bloodstain counter on blood spatter analysis then sacrifice it if it has five or more bloodstain counters on it. When you do, return target creature card from your graveyard to your hand. So this is the card you added. Go ahead. Yeah. So a couple sets ago, one of the big things to do in Rakdos mid was to play Mardu with Yorian and stuff. And if you're playing a Yorian deck that like is Mardu colors, I think you probably end up playing this. We've seen Ch uh, Oath of Chandra see play before, and this is, you know, basically the same card. Um, like, I don't think Rakdos mid or anything's going to play that, but I do think, like, it should see a little bit more play than it currently is, which is, like, basically zero. Um, five creatures dying is a lot, but it's not at all, like, uh, un unfeasible, you know, stuff like that. But I think it's mostly if you're playing, like, uh, you know, like a Mardu Yarian deck, like, you're going to want this. So Also, no, it's one or more, so you can't, like, Wrath and trigger it a whole bunch of times. Yes. They have to be yes. killed one at a time. Yep. So basically, if you're at a, if you're at a Yorion deck that has access to Rakdos mana on like turn two or three, then this is and also you want to deal three damage. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Dealing three for two is is totally fine. Three for three is not. So. So next up, we've got Breakout. This is a two mana Gruul sorcery. Look at the top six cards of your library. You may reveal a creature card from among them. If the card has mana value two or less, you may put it onto the battlefield and it gains haste. If you didn't put the revealed card onto the battlefield, put it into your hand, put the rest on the bottom. So basically, look at the top six. If you've got any creatures in there, you can put it into your hand. If any of those creatures have mana value two or less, you put it into play with haste. So there's going to be two things here. First of all, this looks like an excellent card with Devoted Druid, because you just want to put Devoted Druid into play with haste anyway. But yep. the second part is, and also uh, Vizier of Remedies is one of the other cards that combos with it. The second part is, what are the odds that you actually hit? Like, how many two-drop creatures do you have? Because I never want to cast Breakout and not hit something. So, right. and if I'm paying two mana to look at the top six to just put a creature in my hand, like, that could be okay. You know, the decks have played, like, Eladamri's Call before, but now I'm yeah. paying two to only look at the top six instead of looking for everything. So how many two-value and lower creatures do I have to play in order to consistently hit? And the odds are... In order to hit around 90% of the time, so you need to play between like 18 or 19 creatures minimum that have mana value two or less, which, you know, how many decks can play that many creatures with those mana values? 
like maybe some sort of aggro deck, but then why do you even want Breakout? If it's a combo deck like Devoted Druid, like Devoted Druid plays a lot of cards that aren't creatures, so it's a bit iffy. 18 isn't that many, right? Like, but I think the other like stat is like, you probably don't want to put a Birds of Paradise into play off it, right? Um, so like, I think there's a lot of decks that are easily going to play like 24, you know, or whatever. Hit so Coco decks, basically. Like dots, you know, so. Essentially like Coco decks is one is kind of the way to think about yeah. it. Yeah. But the issue is like, you know, Coco deck is three or less. This is two or less. So yeah. So you, what you have to consider is like, how many lands are you playing? Probably like 20. Then how many creatures are you playing? You're also playing like 18 to 20, probably. You also have to have four copies of this. That doesn't leave a lot of room for creatures that cost more than two or other non-creature spells yes i think um some people were talking about this in amalia and pioneer because that is a deck that benefits from the haste because if you give amalia haste you, you can just kill them um immediately off that and um, then you're in a fourth color the the, the mana is not really a problem um i was actually playing fibblethip in amalia for a long time um because you have four mana confluence and you play some number of gilded goose and prosperous innkeeper but I think at the end of the day, it's like, yeah, like you kind of want to play three mana creatures in magic now. Like, so I think the place I would want this the most is Devoted Druid and Modern because you can play Vizier and also those decks a lot of times will run Stoneforge because you've got Luxior as another combo piece with Devoted Druid. But I'm trying to figure out, like, I just still don't think you can play enough creatures to where this is consistent enough in that deck. I think 18 is easy. Uh, I but like Devoted Druid, like you also, you, you gotta want, you're gonna want a Luxior in the deck. You're probably gonna yes. want some amount of like Court of Calling or like some other search effect that's not just Breakout, then you probably need, if you're playing Stoneforge, you probably also need Cauldron in your deck, so that's like another slot. If you're playing Urza's Saga to fetch the Luxior, then you also need other things to fetch with Urza's Saga, so that's at least one other card that Urza's Saga can fetch. Like, you're not leaving yourself a lot of room for how many creatures you can find, and if you're ever finding a creature that isn't finishing the Devoted combo or Stoneforge, like, you probably don't want to break out into like a Delighted Halfling, for example. That's, that's kind of my point is like it like that's that's why like the the number of successes is like a misnomer with cards like this and it was like why, why i was explaining some math to uh to someone at, at one of the pioneer weeklies about the coco decks um with amalia um is that like you really don't want to coco into like mana dorks right like if, if you're cocoing into mana dorks it may as well have been a whiff right so people should change the math when they're evaluating these deck lists um there's like very few decks where like if you cast Coco and putting in like double birds is like at all an acceptable like thing. Um, so like I don't know how like obviously like Stoneforge is a good hit, Devoted Druid's a good hit, Vizier's a good hit. Like tw that's like twelve good hits, which is like not that far you know off. But like you need what, you what need you more is the like, issue. Like what else are you putting in? Ragavan, you know, like maybe you play Ragavan in this deck and you can't play Ragavan and Devoted Druid because you have no removal. Um, like, I don't know. <laughs> that is really the main sticking point. So it's a matter of like, you need the creatures that you're hitting to matter. Like it, this can't just be hitting, I don't think generic aggro creatures. Cause then why aren't you just playing more generic aggro creatures instead of this right, thing that right. can miss? It's not Coco, you're not putting in two cards. Yeah. So, so you really want it in like a combo deck where the, the thing that I'm cheating into play is actually valuable. And then how many creatures do you have that are valuable enough to play is the next the question. I, th I think I think starting a list like that, like if you were going to play Devoted Druid one and you're already playing Breakout, I think it's worth trying Ragavan. Oh. All right. It is fine to hit it off on two. It's the same as dashing it, right? So better than dashing it because it doesn't bounce. Well, right, right. So and, and it is kind of a mana dork, you know, and stuff. But all right. So moving on. Cease and desist. So this is a split card. The first mode is two mana with hybrid black and green. Instant. Exile up to two cards from a single graveyard. Target player gains two life and draws a card. Second mode, desist. Four, six mana with two of the pips being hybrid white and green. Sorcery, destroy all artifacts and enchantments. I've seen this be played already as like just random graveyard hate out of usually control decks or something or like Amalia or whatever. It seems fine in that regard as a thing that can hit something in the graveyard and then I guess it has a bonus mode to blow up a bunch of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, the fact that Cease is kind of like um, a cling to dust, um, which is like fine, exiling two cards. like, And since it's up to, you can just cast it to like uh, cycle, which is fine. Uh, Desist does have a good amount of targets, like Enigmatic's deck and stuff. Um, where I've really been liking this card, uh, and, and I told Nick about the tech, um, is in blue-black control when you play Torrential Gearhulk. Um, 
because you can cast the desist side and sure it blows up your own gear hulk but that's so uh, weird that that's a thing that you can do yeah yeah <laughs> so i was playing one in that because game one you can use the cease like against like arc light stuff or whatever you know it's a revitalize and stuff but if you ever go up against like enigmatic you can just gear hulk blow up all enchantments um so I think we'll see a good amount of this card in Pioneer. There's enough decks that play a bunch of artifacts or enchantments. The games can go kind of long in that format. Um, and Cease is actually like a main deckable card sometimes. It's kind of, it's like kind of like a cling to dust, right? Which is seen play yeah, sometimes. Yeah. I think it's actually better. It's very rare that most decks ever cast a cling to dust twice in a game. Um, so just being able to exile two is, uh, is nice. So notably, it is eight mana value for collect evidence as well. Eight mana value total because for some reason split cards have the combined mana value. Yes. <laughs> Everything about split cards just makes no sense in the rules to me. <laughs> it's just because they had to resolve it somehow. So they're just like, well, it's just like it's both cards. So yeah, but it's so unintuitive. I think it should just be either or. It should just be if it, if it's asking you a question, it should just be the controller decides which one matters. I mean, they they had I, I assume they had talked about that and decided that summing it made more sense rules wise or something but but then there's so many things that don't make any sense rules rise like why can you gear hulk the sorcery part of this because the card is both an instant and a sorcery when it's when it's a card right uh, what i'm saying is that is just so unintuitive that you can do that but i don't think it is though because like gear hulk doesn't target a spell i think if you ask most players who don't have like our level of knowledge of the game who aren't pros or whatever or don't have like a ton of experience i think if you just ask in the blind most people would probably even if they don't agree with it or like they would probably say that it that regardless of what the rules say it shouldn't be able to hit the sorcery part yeah because because they think it's like two different cards on one which is which yeah, it is i mean it literally is two different cards on one I mean, I mean yes yes so all right moving on drag the canal is a two mana demir instant create a two two if a creature died this turn you gain two life surveil two then investigate so obviously Paying two mana just to make a 2-2 is not good enough. So you do need the morbid part to actually work. So the main question is, can you consistently have a creature die when you're going to play this, especially if you're playing it on two or maybe like slightly after two? And I feel like not really, especially in demure colors, it feels pretty difficult to make this consistently work, like on a curve yeah. that, that you actually want. So where this is mostly seen play right now is in blue black control and pioneer and i'm not a believer um i've played that deck i've played this version the idea behind that is you have fatal push so on turn three you can fatal push their thing and then trigger it there you also have shark typhoon so on turn four you can cash in your shark as a zero zero play this you still get a two two and then you get game life surveil and investigate i just don't think it does enough um what I found myself mostly doing with it is just playing it as a flash 2-2 against like blue-white control. Um, like, um, I'm not, yeah, it's it's being, checking if a creature died in blue-black is just, it's just an awkward color combination for that. Um, for a fine payoff. Like if this was Golgari, it would be really good, right? Yes, yes. Or if it just straight up drew you the card rather than investigate. Like it was gain two life, surveil two, draw a card, card would be really good. Uh, but having to then pay two mana to, to draw it is like really awkward here or like the problem is um with when with this card is the decks that probably want to play it would rather have if a creature died make a two two like i would pay two blue man like you know if this was like gain two life surveil two then investigate as the base side that's way more playable um in blue black so yeah it's just a weird card all right but. so moving on flotsam and jetsam this is another split card. The first mode is two mana, hybrid, green and blue. Instant, mill three, then investigate. The other side, jetsum, six mana with two hybrid demir pips. Sorcery, each opponent mills three cards, then you may cast a spell from each opponent's graveyard without paying its mana cost. That's any spell. If a spell cast this way, we put into a graveyard, exile it instead. Yeah. So I believe you added this to the list. So I talk did. Um so it's only seeing a little bit of play right now, but some of the decks that are currently playing it in Pioneer are like Founding the Third Path, Neoform Atraxa decks. Um, sometimes you'll play it in a Gear Hulk deck because like milling yourself and investigating is fine. Um, but like Jetsam is actually like deceptively powerful as a six mana spell. Um, the fact that it just casts uh, anything without paying for it, well, which, you know, you have to pay the six up front anyway, but yep. it lets you cast whatever you want. Yep, and yeah, we're sometimes a lot of times now they gatekeep this effect behind the cards 
among the milled cards. No, this is just any of them. So, um, so that's kind of like where it's kind of slotting in right now. Like blue green for like that kind of effect is weird. Like we haven't really like it's not actually strategic planning, right? But like it's close to a mono green strategic planning. You know that if there's like some reason to care about this. Um, notably in standard. Um, it probably won't see play until rotation if it sees any play in that at all um because like you know standard so turbocharged right now but if you cast like the the split cards like this when you have collect evidence um as a mechanic now like it, they're always deceptively powerful when it's like an instant or sorcery that like puts itself into your graveyard and then also does something else like you can cast this early to like help you like fix your draws later or like enable collect evidence so, so for example any of these two and six splits is eight so they all pay for analyze the pollen yep and flotsam actually mills over some cards so if you have like collect evidence 10 like off of a uh, raveler or whatever um then like you've probably milled over a non-land to like reach that threshold so, so obviously with flotsam like you can't just play it as you know four mana draw card mill three you have to either like the milling has to be relevant or the clue token has to be relevant to like yeah. creativity or something yeah. or or like the backs or like the jetsam side but you use flotsam as like early games yeah you need some other thing to matter about what this card does like you can't just play it as like, if you were going to play it, you would just play Deduce, right? If you were going to play uh, that type of effect, so. So moving on from this, we've got Gleaming Gear Drake. This is a two mana is it creature. It's a 1-1 one, one artifact creature with flying. When it enters, you investigate. And whenever you sack an artifact, put a plus one counter on Gleaming Gear Drake. So this card to me just seems okay. Although, again, it is a two mana put two different artifacts into play which is always yeah. like potentially good depending on what it is you're doing is it in soul creativity decks so talk about gleaming gear drake yeah so it's mostly for is it in soul um i like it actually quite a bit and playing against it is very frustrating um, because it kills very very quickly um with uh like shrapnel blast and stuff you also um, got like maps and bloods and yes. it makes a clue yeah. um and so, yeah, so it's actually, like, pretty good for that deck. That deck wants more flyers. Um, it wants to get you low. Uh, but there are a couple other applications that people have been doing with it. And one of the versions of Blue, Red, and Soul right now actually plays Sir Ginger. So now you have Sir Ginger and Gleaming Gear Drake. So now, like, um, any sack effect, like, you know, you can spread uh, damage around, basically, and stuff. Um, it also is something that, like, I was trying to make work was, like, uh, I, we had mentioned the animation module deck uh, before, like, this is possibly a card you can play in that deck as, like, a backup plan kind of thing that, like, kind of can, like, glue it together. There are sack outlets in blue-red that let you sack artifacts for free um, and stuff. So, <coughs> like, there's the, uh, there's an ATOG that was printed in uh, Ether World. Yeah, so, like, you can play that, and that's, like, a combo enabler for animation module that also lets you have, like, big Sir Gingers and Gleaming Gear Drakes and stuff, so... But mostly it's just, it's it's pretty good in, in Isn't Soul because yeah, like making two artifacts is really nice for flipping uh, the case on turn one. If you go turn one case, turn two, uh, this, you just flip it immediately, like solve the case immediately. And then on the next turn, you get to, you know, start attacking for a bunch. Uh, unclear whether it's better than Inti in is it in Soul, but it's uh, it's good enough. All right, so moving to the next one, we've got Ill-Timed Explosion, a four mana is it sorcery. Draw two, then you may discard two. When you do, it deals X damage to each creature where X is the greatest mana value among cards discarded this way. So the one place that I've seen this shown up so far is Pioneer BTL. And it seems like if you're in the market for a sweeper, this is a very unique sweeper in that it lets you loot two. Yep, yep. But of note, if you don't need a sweeper and you just draw this, you can just cast it as a four mana divination because um, the discard is optional. Um, so... I was actually playing it in Arclight for a little bit uh, as, as one of my anti-Rakdos cards. Because one of the things you want to do when you're playing Phoenix against Rakdos is you want cards like Brotherhood's End to like mop up their creatures without having to target Bone Crushers and Graveyard Trespassers. Um, but you also want like raw card draw to fight through Go Blanks and Duresses. And so this is like a nice little like medium, I think, for a lot of the blue-red decks. Um, I think creativity can play it as well. You have a lot of cards you can discard. Even if you're like your Hulk version, you can always discard like your Hulks or Magma Opus and to like Wrath the Board. There's also plenty of expensive things you can discard. So probably the numbers that matter on this is like five. So you can kill Shieldred and whatnot. Yeah, five is five is a big one. 
Four is totally acceptable as well because uh, it kills like Sentinel of the Nameless City, which is pretty popular. And Adeline and like all yep. those guys. Yep. And yeah. uh, obviously BTL has a ton of expensive stuff, but even like Phoenix, you can discard Phoenix. That's four. You can discard yeah. Treasure Cruise. Yeah, four. Yep. yep, yep, yeah. Yeah, so it's it's actually like pretty powerful. I, I, I think this card is good. I think we should see a little bit more of it. So it's kind of like a split card. So it's a divination or a board wipe. Mm -hmm. So moving on. The next card's quite the doozy. Insidious Roots. Yeah. This is two mana Golgari enchantment. Creature tokens you control have tap, add one mana of any color. Whenever one or more creature cards leaves your graveyard, create a zero one green plant creature token, then put a plus one plus one counter on each plant you control. So if you've got a deck that's built around having creatures leave your graveyard, like, oh, I don't know, cat oven, you can just keep triggering this over and over and over and building a massive army of plants that will continuously get bigger and they will get bigger much quicker than you would expect. Oh, and they tap. This card's also insane with Tyvar because then all of the yep. plants can tap for mana immediately. immediately. Yep. And he mills. Yep. So we've seen Insidious, yes. we've seen this Insidious Roots deck single-handedly build Golgari Sack. So now you can play that instead of Mayhem Devil. Unclear whether it's better than Mayhem Devil versions or not. Um, right. What I can tell you is I have played against this deck three times and I already think it needs to be banned. It's so insane. Yeah, yeah, I... Thankfully, I haven't played against it, but I, I think the main thing holding it back is like how to build it. Obviously, it's a new, it's a new deck. It's so also it's really very, bad against blue white. Yes, yes. Um, and so I think it'll take people a long time to figure that stuff out to really tune it. Uh, it's even play, seeing play in standard where you can loop uh, colossal sky turtles uh, with each other, and you just discard sky turtle, return sky turtle, you know, and like you just set up that, and then you just have this huge plant army. Also, it's hard to fight it as well because so let's say, you know, you're against the you're against the Insidious Roots deck, right? And you think, well, their whole deck is built around having creatures leave their graveyard, so I'll just play like, you know, my graveyard hate, I'll play on licensed hearse. Ooh, whoops, that triggers it too. So I've been in situations where like they've got the cat oven loop and you know something else, and or like Oval Chase Daredevil or whatever. I play on licensed hearse, I'm like, well, I can't even target their stuff because I'm actually causing them to gain more tokens and power if I exile their creatures from their graveyard. Yep. <laughs> yeah. This this Not feels like the exact kind of thing. It feels just like Mayhem Devil, like Inti. It just feels like one of those cards that's ho like, holy crap, does this have to do everything? Do the plants have to get pumped forever? Do they also have to generate mana on top of it? Like, Jesus. Yeah, I, I feel like you can fix some of this by just like, why does it pump up each plant, you know, rather than target plant? like. No, no, are you on board are you on board with like so i i have my collage of ban of cards that need to go <laughs> this i i've added this to the list oh yeah <clears throat> i think the only thing holding it back is like one it's new so people don't exactly agree on like what's the most optimal way of building it and two this deck gets blown out by temp lockdown so like those are the welcome main to, things holding it back yeah welcome to i think perhaps one of the most powerful and egregious cards in pioneer temporary lockdown like Holy fuck, that card is so good right now. This is something that, like, even Saffron Olive tweeted this recently, talking about how exile-based sweepers make the game less interesting because there's no way to fight them. I can't play Selfless Spirit, you know? I can't, like, what sideboard cards do I play against Temporary Lockdown? It's there's, basically there's like, you know, are you playing a deck that relies on, you know, you have a board, which is most decks. You know, the only decks that don't rely on having a board are, like, Lotus Field. And right. if I'm not playing blue for counter spells. Like, what am I supposed to do? I play out my permanence. Like, they're blue-white control. I have to I have to put pressure into play. I can't just sit around doing nothing. And then the moment I put enough pressure into play, they just go temp lockdown, sweep everything, you lose. Yes. You can't recur them back. Yeah, it's like, there's a reason why, like, Amalia and Convoke, they play, like, three, like, it's, you know, three to four get losses is pretty stock in Convoke right now. And you bring them, like, you bring them all in against... Uh, Against blue white, yeah, I I think temporary lockdown is uh, a huge fucking problem for this format. All right, so moving on, we have Izoni, Center of the Web. This is a six mana five four legendary elf. It is black and green. It has menace, and it says whenever Izoni enters the battlefield or attacks, so it's got the Titan trigger. You may collect evidence four. If you do, you create two two one black and green spiders with menace and reach, and then you can sack four creatures, four tokens as an activated ability to surveil two, draw two, gain two. So this is a card you wanted on the list. Go ahead. Yes. So the main reason I added this is because I think this card was designed for a standard format that doesn't exist because we have an extra year's worth of cards. Um, 
and because I think a lot of the Golgari, I think this was supposed to be like a top end for like the Golgari deck. Oh. And I do think it's I do think it's playable. I think it's a card to look at post rotation as well. Um, we're still gonna have um, a bunch of good enablers. We have cards like Flotsam Jetsam, like uh, that that whole cycle of split cards. There's like a lot of ways to just like play this as six immediately collect evidence. Obviously, if you're not playing, if you're not collecting evidence, this card is like not worth six mana. But um, in standard, it's not that bad to get to six mana currently. Um, it's just Rafine exists, and I don't. I think this card was intended to be for a format where Rafine didn't exist. So, so by the way, so I think for standard. So, so you said, this is for primarily for standard. What do you think of the change to three or rotation? I hate it. I hate it so much. So why? But like, uh, elaborate. So it's actually I, actually before that. Can you explain to why you think they made the change and then explain why you think it's bad? So I think they made the change and I know they mentioned that the change would help people play standard more. And I think that's wrong. I don't think it did. I um, think the idea is supposed to be that, you know, people don't want to buy cards that rotate. Yes. So we'll just yeah. lengthen the rotation so that you have, you know, so that your investment in the cards lasts longer basically. Yes. Yes, that right. That's the idea, and that as a result, people will play more standard because they'll they'll buy standard decks. But it doesn't work like that because two years versus three years doesn't matter. If you don't really want your cards to rotate, you just will play a different format. The other would there is, would there be a amount of years that actually would matter? Like if they extended it to five years, if rotation was six years, then would it have that intended if you effect? Made it five or six years, it just becomes closer and closer to Pioneer, right? And at that point, it's like you play the format because you already have the cards for Pioneer, right? You know, um, that's that's like the it's like, yeah, like if you keep adding more and more years, it just basically isn't standard anymore. Right. Um, and, and like so. Um, but OK, so anyway, so why I, is it bad? So I think it actually makes prices of decks be more expensive other than less expensive. And part of this has to do with most people don't really know. Uh, cards uh, sets are not printed while they're in standard like like it the entire lifetime of a set in standard is not its print window um sets go out of print when the demand is no longer worth it for them to print it so higher demand sets will have more boxes printed so currently most of the most powerful sets in standard are out of print there's no longer going to be an increase in supply of these cards uh the new capenna uh Kamigawa, stuff like that. Um, so by having three years, it doesn't, you know, you're going to actually make the economics and the expensive cards in standard more expensive because you have to play with these cards longer while they're not in print. Um, and if it's a good enough card that it's a standard staple, like say Shouldred, like when it's out of print, that is a huge, huge drain on the format. Now, you can be like, well, Shouldred, the Shouldred is not very good in standard right now. People probably shouldn't be playing it. And I generally agree. I think you're better off just not playing Shouldred in your decks. Um, but the fact of the, the matter is that card is like $90. Um, and Triomes are expensive now and stuff like that. Uh, even your normal um, Midnight Hunt lands and Crimson Vow lands are kind of expensive. So it's just the thing is, is like sets, sets were not in print for the full two years that they were legal and standard before. Adding an extra year onto that is only going to make a format that should be the accessible format more expensive. Um, and I think that does far more to hurt standard than it does to, to help standard. So speaking of standard, for the help of you. Yeah. so it seems like, so the idea for standard I think is supposed to be, this is the format that is supposed to be accessible to new players because it's lower cost than buying into older formats and because we want to push new cards. And even with the insane power creep that we've seen in recent years, not every card can be so powerful that it sees play in older formats. Therefore, you want a format where most of the rares in the set are going to, you know, there's going to be demand for them. So the standard is there to create that demand to sell sets. Now, I believe that, so here is the reasons I think that most people attribute to a drop in standard attendance. So one is, well, there's a lot of different ones. First is just like a lack of a good organized play system or worthwhile tournaments and prizing, but that applies to every format, not just standard. Uh, there is Arena and Arena having essentially a free to play platform, N not exactly, but basically you can go on Arena and play for free. And Arena also doesn't have most of the older cards. Therefore, the people that are jumping into Arena are playing a lot of standard as opposed to anything else. So 
There's only so much bandwidth that you have, even if you enjoy paper standard, if you're also playing online standard, you're necessarily gonna be playing less paper standard. There is the increase, there is the price of standard decks that are very high and in many cases are as high or sometimes even higher than the prices of decks that you can buy in older formats. So basically why would I pay for, you know, why would I pay four to $500 to get a standard deck that's gonna rotate when I can pay four to $500 to get a Pioneer deck that isn't gonna rotate allegedly? Then there's just the fact of the cards rotating at all. A lot of people just don't want to invest, period, in any cards that are going to rotate. And then there's also a pretty good track record of bad standards environments, like a lot of them in a row, particularly in the fire design era. So like I would say that was roughly between like Kaladesh and Throne of Eldraine. Yeah, just having horrible, lots of yeah. standard environments that were bad back to back. And in general, just having like a very shaky you know, inconsistent quality of how fun it is to play the format, which obviously depends on each format. But in general, it feels like you're on a pendulum where at any moment the format can just swing into being terrible and it's not going to resolve until at least three months later. So let me know all of those reasons that I've laid out. Are those all accurate? Did I miss anything? Or is there like a way, to, is there anything to expand on in that? Yeah, I think mostly, I think something that should also be noted is um, it is really important or well has been for most of magic's history that standard be a format that people uh want to play now want as in they play um oftentimes players need to be forced to play a format as in you make that the tournament season and then people will play it we've already seen that with the standard season a lot of standard cards went up in price so if you maintain people's tournament play for it it does prop up the price you need stores to be able to justify buying boxes of sealed product and in order to do that, you need your cards to be worth something. I mean, they need, the box needs to be worth more than the 85 or $90 or whatever it costs to buy it from the distributor. And if standard has a robust play system, that helps with that. Because now your cards that would otherwise be 25 cent rares are now maybe dollar rares. And that can like improve your margins as a shop a little bit more. Um, the other issue is COVID kind of changed everything about magic. Um, the commander focus... Obviously, for most of lockdown, that was really the only magic people could play. And it's hard to convince people to go back to a system of, well, my cards are only going to be able to be played for two years or whatever. Um, so you, you have the, I feel like you have this like inertia involved with that where it's difficult to get people to like change. They've already settled into commander mode. So um, I personally think you should just do away with standard and focus on selling packs to like commander players or pioneer players or modern players in that capacity um but yeah like you need new players to also be able to play standard because you know one of the things is someone like standard is the format where you should be able to play cards uh that you started by initially opening up booster packs and then supplementing them later you know by i opened up like two rafines in my booster packs you know I now I'll buy the other two and I'll play a deck with with uh, Rafine um, in it, and standard should be that way. And so there's like a, a bunch of different reasons. Um, people's collections were no longer kept up to date after lockdown, so it's harder for people to buy into standard. Now they have to buy into standard for the full sticker price, basically, instead um, of gradually as sets are being released. Yes, yes, and so it's it's harder to get people to start even to begin with. Um, I think it should be pretty telling that. Um, Spellhold and Collector Legion are like, you know, pretty popular shops, and neither one was able to fire standard FMs. And they don't draft, no one drafts anymore either. Right, right, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah there's a lot less draft, and that is definitely because of Arena. Um, also, draft prices have gone up recently as well, yeah, by a lot. It's, it's crazy, it's, it's crazy. Um, you know, and part of that has to do with like, that cards are worthless, so like, People, if, if if the cards that I'm opening up from my three draft packs can help defray the cost somewhat, I can justify paying $15, 20 to draft if I can sell like seven or eight dollars worth of cards at the end of the night. You just can't do that anymore. My rares are that are, are worthless now. Um, but but yeah. So one of the biggest shops in Southern California can't fire standard in an area that definitely caps out standard RCQ. So I think there's a myriad of reasons. So I can say from personal experience two things. First of all, when I used to work in the card shop, we would have a certain allocation of standard booster boxes and we would set aside some amount of them to draft or just to sell to people. But we would take the other standard boxes and we would crack all of them and sell the singles. 
And as I understand it, that is not done anymore. And as far as I'm aware, the only sealed product that is actually profitable now is collector boxes. Yes. Now, um, there are some shops where it's worth it for them to crack. And I will say Spellhold is a shop uh, in Orange County that actually can benefit from cracking because the Pioneer players want to play with the new cards and they fire that uh, every year. Um, and so, but... Yeah, most shops like, and, and I think Finch also fires um, some different formats and, and they actually have drafts and stuff like that. So they have different, and they sell a lot online and stuff. But yeah, most shops, it's just not worth cracking product um, anymore. Like your the average price of a rare is so bad that like, it, you know, it's just not worth cracking. Um, but the so. thing is like, that isn't even offset by saying like, well, the cards are, are cheaper, but that makes buying constructed cheaper because it's not, it's not no the, the card. it's not the total price of the cards that is cheaper. It's the yeah. distribution of the price because there are still cards right. like Fable, Shieldred that are super expensive. Yes, yes, yep, yep. If shops are cracking less product, your mythic rare prices go up, right? So any savings you would have had on your rares is offset by more expensive mythics. So the other thing I wanted to say from my own personal experience was when I first started playing competitive Magic, I started in uh, Rise of the Eldrazi in April. 2010. At no point ever in my entire time playing Magic have I gone to a shop or gone to TCG player and been like, here's $500, I'm going to buy a deck. I would just draft and I would acquire cards that way and the cards that I didn't want, I would trade them to people or I would sell them to the shop and I would just get credit or trade them in for other cards. And I slowly accumulated a collection that way and that is how I was able to play Standard and then uh, at the time, Pioneer didn't exist, so it was straight to modern and eventually legacy and whatnot. Like at no point was I ever in a position where I'm like, here is multiple hundreds of dollars all at once. I'm buying all the staples and, and playing this deck now. And that was also a good way to draft because like, yes, the draft was $15, but you were pretty likely to open, you know, some value in cards. Sometimes you'd get yes. lucky and you'd open like the Chase Mythic Rare and you'd get all your money back and even more so, but a lot of the times you wouldn't, but you'd still get like some percentage of your entry fee back in cards that you could justify as either, well, this card I would have otherwise bought and now I didn't have to buy it, or I was never interested in this card, but I can still trade it to someone. But now the average price of the cards, not the total overall price of this entire set, but the average price of the cards is so bad that it feels like you may as well be phantom drafting because everything you're opening is worthless by and large. So you can't accumulate a collection that way. I also find that hardly anyone even trades anymore. Like people just yeah. go and they buy the singles that they want and then they just have those and they don't like hardly anyone has their trade binder. And usually anyone who does have a trade binder is like a commander player. And the only things they're trading are random yeah. older cards that don't see play. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I, I think trading is just an outdated thing in general with internet uh, marketplaces and stuff. But yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people start out by piecemealing decks, but there are a lot of people that'll just go and straight up buy a deck. But, you know, even that is like if the deck if the total price of the deck costs more that affects those people more as well right so uh, one of the things i think they could do to get actual people playing standard is sell challenger decks that are actually reasonably priced that are like a hundred dollars or cheaper that are fully decked out this is all, like here's the the 50 list or the accepted tier one version of the deck that is actually competitive and it's all the cards in the deck it's not Challenger Arclight Phoenix where we're not playing the full play set of Arclights or, you know, Lotus Field that's not playing all four Lotus Fields or, it, it you know, it's not, here's the deck but the lands suck and you only get like one shock yeah. land. Like, no, yeah. it is, it's a deck and you can pay, you know, $35, $40 and that is a complete standard deck and you can just go and play the event with the deck immediately. Yes. Uh, Pokemon has things like that, but I think the problem with Magic is because of the nature of like deck building and magic and stuff, it's a little harder for them to predict it. And for products, you have to have a, a good amount of time between finalizing the product and getting it into players' hands that I don't really think it's very feasible. For well, we, we've seen stuff. them do things like, you know, here's Pioneer Lotus Field, but they just don't print all the cards in the deck. Yes, yes. So they'll give you like not all the dual lands, so your mana base is terrible, right. or they'll give you not all the not the full play set of all four of the necessary cards in the deck. Yes. My my point is I think it's easier to do that with Pioneer as opposed to a standard format, right? Where if it takes me six months from making the deck lists to getting them to players' hands, 
there's a large chance that, that doesn't matter anymore in standard um, because it's lower power level there's fewer sets like you have to be really really good at predicting what is good and what people want to play in standard to have any sort of precons and i don't think it's really viable i think you can do it with pioneer but it was such a fucking joke when uh the pioneer arc light had two arc light phoenix in it you know um, it's like what are you doing like you the deck isn't even yeah. completed yes Okay, so let's say you're in charge, your mission is you're at WotC and you have unilateral decision-making powers and your goal is standard needs to be a highly attended popular format again. You can make any changes you want. What do you do? Um, <clears throat> hmm. Well, I think you kind of need to, I think the answer is to print less stuff, you know? Um, just standard you know, product or just product overall? In Standard product. Like, you want to incentivize people to draft and open up your booster packs. Um, so... Does that mean eliminating collector boosters or highly uh, reducing them? You know, uh, I think... You, I mean, I think you probably have to reduce some of that some of that bloat because, like, you have so much bloat for, uh, for like, rares, basically. Um, and stuff like that. Um, the other thing is make a push towards trying to have standard decks actively use less mythic rares. Um push more dual lands into uncommons rather than rares, um, stuff like that. Um, so what about something that TCGs like Pokemon do where every product that you buy in paper has a code that's redeemable for Moto and or arena. So like if you buy a pack in paper, you get a pack on Moto. Uh -huh. I think stuff like that's really good. Um, I think those systems are good. Uh, something that, that is actually interesting is people would posit, well, um, if somebody has access to digital magic like arena are they less aren't they less likely to spend money in paper and what we've actually found is it's the opposite people who play on arena first want to start playing in paper but they want to be able to play the format that they play on arena um so you want to make standard and, and draft more accessible i don't know i haven't sat down and like mapped out like anything that i would do but i think i i don't think there's like a good clean fix to the scenario that they're in because i don't think the fault of like standard decks being prohibitively expensive is like exclusively the issue of them like not designing standard and stuff like that like i think there's other like printing mechanisms that create that where it's weird to be like well cards are so cheap but you can't just go and buy cards because they're so the problem is they're so cheap that stores don't want to crack product uh, you need to make it worth it for stores to crack product honestly maybe the thing that you have to do is just like make less profit on the back end of selling boxes to distributors you know stuff like that like um because currently like you know it, it like um at least when i worked at at uh, legion um, the cost of buying a booster box from a distributor was like 80 to 85 dollars you know that's really high uh, you don't really make much profit um off of that. the profit on a booster box was like 20 bucks yeah at, at most yeah like and if you if you can lower Know, the upfront cost of cracking product then perhaps that would uh, make things more accessible but my personal speculation is obviously yeah. there's a big confluence of different factors but i think the main one is collector boxes oversaturate the market with mostly lower tier rares that people don't yes. want yes. and it therefore causes a price bifurcation where you have most of the rares in the set are worthless even if they see play and it's only a handful of rares and mostly the mythic rares that become extremely expensive and therefore, because it's expensive, because you have so much of this, stores don't want to crack boxes because you're unlikely to hit, you know, the one handful of a few cards that are actually worthwhile. And nobody wants to draft because nobody wants to pay $15 to get $0 in value. And no one wants to sell the cards that they open from their collector booster because they're not worth any. So it's like if I open up a bunch of like 10 bulk rares that are all like under 50 cents, no store is going to buy that from me for any real amount of money. So I'll just hold on to the cards, you know? So, all right that's what a lot of people do so well this has been a very long but i think worthwhile tangent on standard <sighs> so moving on from azoni we have kaya spirits justice this is quite wordy so bear with me four mana orzhov planeswalker starts with three loyalty when it has a static ability whenever one or more creatures you control and or creature cards in your graveyard are exiled you may choose a creature card from among them until end of turn target token you control becomes a copy of it except with flying and then the abilities are plus two, surveil two, then exile a card from your graveyard. Plus one, create a one, one flying spirit. Minus two, exile target creature you control for each other player, exile up to one target creature that player controls. So you wanted this on the list, so go ahead. So some of the Grease Fang lists play it. 
because you can plus make a token, and then after they've killed your Grease Fang, you just plus two surveil, exile Grease Fang, turn a token into a copy of the Grease Fang, you do the thing. So that's it mostly. It's just a sideboard card for Grease Fang. Any sh if it does that for Grease Fang, does it have any shot in Amalia or no? Probably not. Uh, I think with Amalia, you'd rather play like one of the Vivian Planeswalkers instead, but maybe. All right. Next up, we've got Kalan, Inquisitive Prodigy. This is a adventure creature. So it is... I'll talk about the adventure mode first and then the creature. So the adventure mode is Tail the Suspect. It's a two mana Simic Sorcery and it's Investigate. You may play an additional land this turn. So a worse growth spiral. And then the creature side is a legendary creature for four mana that is blue and green. It's a human fairy detective, a three, four, and it has flying vigilance. And whenever it attacks, destroy up to one target artifact. If you controlled that permanent draw card. So sort of a Trigon Predator, but with bigger stats, but more mana. Also, you can blow up your own artifacts to draw a card. So again, you wanted this on the list, so go ahead. Uh, mostly just because I've been playing it in like blue-green growth spiral decks in Pioneer, um, like blue-green world tree, stuff like that. So uh, yeah, it's a worse growth spiral, but I think it's good enough. Um, so. so basically any deck that was already playing growth spiral, this is just more growth spirals? Yeah, if they want more, if they want like more, uh, more of the land ramp stuff, this is good. Like I would play some in gates, you know? All right. So next up, we've got Kylox's Volt Strider. This is a three mana blue and red artifact vehicle. It's a four, four, and you can either crew it for two or you can collect evidence six to turn it into a creature. And then it has, whenever it attacks, you may cast an instant or sorcery spell from your card from among cards exiled with it. So you can exile cards with it via the collect evidence. If that spell would be put into a graveyard, put it on the bottom of its owner's library instead. So basically, the card gains a uh, flashback for its cost. Yep. So again, this is a card you added, so go ahead. Uh, mostly because I was playing this in some shells with Treasure Cruise or See the Truth, um, because you can still delve with this. Um, so, and the Treasure Cruise fulfills the Collect Evidence 6. So it's just that. Uh, I didn't really like it very much in Phoenix, but maybe there's a shell that plays like See the Truth with it. So, yep. All right. So next up, another one of the most egregious cards in the set. Leyline of the Guild Pact yeah. is a four mana enchantment and it has one of the, the most unique costs in the game. It's four mana and every single one of them are green hybrid mana where the other mana symbol is one of the other colors. So green white, then green blue, then green black, then green red. It says uh, as a ley line, of course, if it's in your opening hand, you may begin the game with it on the battlefield and its abilities are each non-land permanent you control is all colors and lands you control are every basic land type in addition to their other types. So the two places that we've seen this shown up primarily so far, the first is obviously uh, Mono Green Devotion in Pioneer because you can start the game with a triple green pip permanent on the battlefield, which makes uh, Nykthos immediately tap for four extra mana that you didn't have to invest in. And then the second main place that we've seen this show up is in, Pine is in Modern Rhinos of all places where it combines with Scion of Draco because Scion of Draco gives your creatures abilities based on whatever colors they are, including itself. And since this makes all of your cards every color, it means all of the creatures under Scion get all of its abilities. So the other, and then beyond that, basically the things to understand that this card does is it gives you domain instantly. It means that all of your lands are every card, are every uh, basic type, meaning that things like, you know, Castle Garenbrig, for example, in Pioneer Devotion, you can just cast Castle Garenbrig with any land, not just a forest, because all of your lands are forests. If you've got any cards that care about amount of colors or certain colors or certain land types, it works with all of those things. So I know you've been playing some of Pioneer uh, Mono Green now, and yeah. just give me your thoughts on that. Uh, Sign so, of Draco, Rhinos, and if there's any other yeah. applications for this. So I kind of ranted when this card is spoiled. This card sucks. Uh, it's not a good magic. Uh, it is, however, part of like broken bullshit. Um, it's bad design. There's no fair way to, way to play this card because if you had to play it fairly, you would pay zero mana. Like this card is not worth like its mana cost. It's not worth putting into your deck unless you're doing some fucking busted combo bullshit like Sign of Draco, which by the way uh, had a 63% win rate uh, at the Modern RC. Deck is totally broken, and we're gonna see something banned from it. Um, and you can put it into any deck. You could play Hammer Time with it. You could play, you know, you just put your eight cards into it and you just mulligan for it. Uh, it's totally broken. Um, but th there's just like, what I mean by the card's not good is there's no like fair way to play the card. It's the other thing about it is, I guess one thing I didn't mention is that because all of your lands are every land type, it gives you access to every color immediately. So, yes. although yes. I don't think you can tech, like 
you can't build a deck that is like four to five colors under the assumption that you will always have yeah. this in your opening hand. So your land base still does actually have to be able to generally yes. cast yeah. what you're trying yeah, to. Yeah. Right. That's why this card does like like if you're playing this in a fair way, it does nothing. So basically, like, you know, it's not astrolabe. It's not just giving you access to every yeah. color because your mana base already has to be able to produce those colors when you don't have it it's in your really opening hand. Have it like 40, 40, whatever percent of the time, like assuming you mulligan to six or whatever. Like, you know, like that. that's what I mean by like this card doesn't do anything. You're only playing it because you're trying to cheat on like, you know, like abusing like a free spell. Like there's no fair way to play it. Like I will say I've always I've always despised ley lines cuz I think they just cause super yeah. high variance where yeah. Now the game is all about like mul aggressively mulliganing to the to the ley line. You get to start with effects in play that are zero mana that are oftentimes difficult to remove for your opponent because like a four mana enchantment, which basically every ley line is, I think are a lot of times more difficult yeah. to remove than other permanent types like specifically Leyline of the void is one of the more played ones that is just a huge problem where you don't have to invest anything in hating your graveyard opponent uh this one's probably the most broken Leyline ever made right because it's proactive uh, yeah. as opposed to the other ones it's it's weird it's like it's the most broken but like not because of like it has a super pushed like texture in it, right it's you know <laughs> so it's funny that like it's one of the weaker ley lines on its own you know like it just lets you basically play like free spells is basic so aside from how much we hate it uh yeah what is the what is the evaluation of the card in terms of just how good it is uh in modern it's broken because of scion but you would never play it without scion so like there's no way to really like the card is like unplayable without scion in modern and in pioneer i don't even think it's very good in mono green either um it's fine um it enables some fast starts um notably it does do two things which is the current builds play for castle garen break so it does mitigate that a little bit um and old growth troll and stuff um but it does protect your board versus vanishing first which does come up um but like i've been i've been pretty happy cutting it post board for things and i feel like the deck is probably better just like without it but you may just want to play a game one for the free combo wins of like starting with four devotion Okay, so see, you know, it's cards like this in Insidious Roots that in the other video we made is what led me to make the statement that the designers are incompetent. Because I just look at this yes. card and I'm like, first of all, why are you still printing ley lines? Ley lines suck. Secondly, I look at this card, it's like, did nobody look at this card and think, hmm, it has quadruple green pips. Maybe that'll be a problem with Nykthos. Or, hmm, yes. it it gives all of your colors, all Literally. of your permanents every color. Is that going to be a problem with Scion of Draco? There's, oh, we'll just print it anyway. Who yeah. cares? Yeah, like we literally banned... A green ley line in Pioneer. Like <laughs> also, one of the like most egregious cards that they've printed has been Astrolabe. This card also has the potential to like you all of your mana is perfect now. You don't right. your colors right. don't matter. Like this is another card that does that. There's nothing about this card that I look at and go, ooh, this is interesting, or ooh, that looks like it'll be fun. It's like it looks like it'll do a See, bunch of broken BS and annoy the, people. The thing with most the thing with most ley lines, like ley line of sanctity, ley line of the void is you can cast there there are tons of matchups where they come in where casting them is a real thing um but also they're mostly sideboard cards right so like it's just weird to me to like not do that yet it's, i i fucking hate the design of this card there's no fair way to, way to play it i would never ever pay four mana for this effect in my entire life so the only thing that you're going to do with this is like mulligan for it you know um, it's just a horrible design. Oh, also, it's every color, so it's pitchable to all the pitch spells. Yes. So, like, the Rhino's deck hat is now playing, like, four Force Negation, four Subtlety, and you can pitch these to them. Yep. Because this pitches to it. Yep. All right. So, moving on. Lightning Helix. So, uh, it is now uh, not a new card, but it's now Pioneer Legal because it has been printed into Standard. So, it'll show up in, like, Boros Burn decks probably, and that's it. Anything else to really talk uh, about here? Actually, it's a staple in Niv. It's really good in Niv to Light, and I think Boros Burn is basically unplayable. Um, so those are my thoughts on it. <laughs> Just Niv because it's a removal spell that gains life, so it's good against yeah, aggro. Yeah. And it's also a Boros card, so Niv needs it. Yep. All right, moving on. No More Lies, a two mana blue and white instant. Counter target spell unless its controller pays three. If that spell is countered this way, exile it instead of putting it into its owner's graveyard. So a strict upgrade to the two mana counter spell slot in Pioneer Blue White Control. It's also better than Mono Leak because it exiles the card, which is sometimes relevant. Uh, basically, is only really playable in like blue-white 
X control decks in Pioneer. It makes them, it's not like a groundbreaking, super huge improvement to the deck, but it is an upgrade to cards like Make Disappear. So uh, as insufferable as Blue-White Control and Pioneer is, this just makes it a little bit more insufferable, but otherwise doesn't change much. I, I think it's one of those weird ones where I actually think it's the opposite in that. I don't think the counter spell part is really an upgrade much. Um, there's not a meaningful difference between two and three in most of that format, but the exile is like hyper relevant um, with the amount of delve spells and graveyard shenanigans. Delve, reanimation, cards that yeah, keep recycling yeah. from your graveyard, flashback. So I think I think that's the most egregious part of it. I don't think I do think that um, blue white control before, in my opinion, should have played almost no counter spells. Um, just play Dovin's veto like. Um, and just spot removal creatures. And I generally feel that like, uh, there are some decks that are sideboarding No More Lies, like Blue, White, and Soul plays them in the sideboard, but it's really bad. Um, so I think you really want to be like a board wipe deck uh, to play this card. So. As, a, as a side note, I posted on Twitter recently after having played a bunch of leagues that I feel, I said, I feel like if you were to hypo hypothetically score Pioneer as a format on a 10 point scale, if you were to assign it some kind of point value, if you banned blue white control, the format would immediately improve by two points. Oh yeah, for sure. So it's actually gotten to the point now where like the, the blue white control match, like the deck is just absolutely miserable to play against. And it's it's even worse than what you would traditionally think of as the most miserable matches to play against, like Grease Fang, Lotus Field, like these highly uninteractive combo matchups that are hard to fight. I would rather play any of those decks other rather than blue white control. And even when I play against a deck like Lotus Field, I still feel like, you know, I've got a shot, like, okay, I, maybe I can aggro them out before they get there. Against blue white control, I just feel like I can't do anything, and then they'll just sweep away all my stuff and out card advantage me, and then the game will drag on for 20 turns. And it's to the point where, like, I'm playing on Moto and not Arena, and therefore, if I'm playing a league, I'm investing 100 play points or 10 ticks into it, so I kind of have to play the matchup because I got to try to win. But if that wasn't the case, and I was just playing on, like, hypothetically, if Pioneer was on the Arena ladder... I would just quit every single matchup the moment that I saw it was blue-white. Yeah, I mean, the thing with blue-white is it doesn't have a substantially broken win rate or anything. Uh, it has some pretty bad matchups. But, like, yeah, playing against it is horrible. And the problem I have with blue-white is because everything is a catch-all answer for the deck now. Like, you can't really... Like, it feels like sideboarding on both sides just doesn't really matter. And I play a lot of Pioneer, and, like, my sideboard cards don't really feel like they matter very much, even if they're, you know, like dresses and shit like that every because everything is just like a redundant catch-all it's like well you just kind of have to hope they don't have their draw spells and you can so uh, i'll give a good example i was recently playing against i was playing uh aetherworks marvel energy deck that i've been tinkering around with to see if it's any good and i was just encountering blue white control and seeing how that matchup is just absolutely horrible for the aetherworks marvel deck so i'm like i'm gonna put thought distortion in my sideboard so that i can get them right mm -hmm. and then i'm playing a matchup against blue white and I'm like, okay, I just need to draw one more land to hit Thought Distortion, and then I can like get them, and then I can resolve my Marvel and win. And I hit the sixth land, I'm like, yeah, Thought Distortion, let's go. I Thought Distortion them, and one of the cards in their hand is Hullbreaker Horror. And I'm just like, oh, I just yep. lose. Yep. Like, I literally can't answer this, and I'm just gonna lose now. Yep. It feels like you just can't answer anything. All of their removal spells hit everything that you can play. All their sweepers exile and hit everything. All of their cards generate like redundant value. You can die to Emperor, Man Lands, to Fairy, and Shark Typhoon. So it doesn't feel like you have any chance of like racing them. You just have to jam your spells into their counters and then they'll outvalue you. It's just horrible. Yeah. It used to be that like you didn't have to jam into counter spells, but like you have to in this format. So you can't be patient because like they just get to answer whatever you are patient to resolve so it's so weird too because like hypothetically i've always thought that like one of the big problems with control decks is that their play pattern is they'll just resolve jace or teferi or whatever like card advantage engine they have and then they'll literally have no other way of beating you and you've effectively lost the game but now you're just going to lose to they ult to fairy and then they tuck it back into their deck and then 20 turns will go by where they exile all of your lands and like that kind of gameplay is horrible and now you don't lose to that. Now you lose to Wandering Emperor gets flashed in and they make a Samurai and then they plus the Samurai and it's a 3-3 three, three and they hit you and they activate their, rec their uh, Restless Anchorage and they hit you with that and they cycle and make a Shark and they hit you with that. And so hypothetically, they're killing you faster and therefore the matchup should be better because it's not all dragged out. But I actually find it to be more unfun. Yeah, me too. Yep. But I'm trying to figure out like why that is. Is it just because it just feels because so your impossible? Choices, to your, your choices matter less, right? Like, you know, 
it's it's harder to actually like sideboard you know because like, they just have all of these redundant threats it's not like you can just go oh well they got to resolve to fairy to win this game right. so i'll just make sure i deal with that negate and duress are, are fine against them but when their whole deck is the same card right you know it just feels like what's the point mm -hmm. all right moving on from no more lies we've got push and pull yet another two and six mana split card so the two mana side push is uh, two mana with white and black hybrid, sorcery, destroy target tapped creature. And the other side is pull six mana with two Rakdos hybrids. Sorcery, put up to two target creatures from a single graveyard onto the battlefield under your control. They gain haste, sacrifice them at the beginning of the next end step. So this is another card you added. So go ahead. Yeah, uh, the main reason I wanted to add this is because we haven't really seen a card that's six mana that returns two creatures, even for one turn before. So there could be some uh, weird reanimator stuff with that. So... Is this mostly like a control, like mostly, I've seen this card cast a little bit. Yeah. It seems like it's mostly just like kind of a bad removal spell that then very late in the game Scales can produce blue. value. Yep, yep, that's exactly it, so. All right, uh, moving on from that, there is Repulsive Mutation, X, green, blue, instant. Put X plus one counters on target creature you control, then counter up to one target spell unless its controller pays mana equal to the greatest power among creatures you control. So it is a pump spell slash counter spell. You don't technically have to pay anything for X. And it basically just says counter a spell unless its controller pays mana equal to your greatest power. And then the more mana you have, the more you can make them pay slash the more counters you can put on a thing. Uh, this is another card you added, so go ahead. Yeah, the main place I've been seeing this is like Zulists in Modern. Some of them have been playing it um, because it's kind of like a counter spell that can scale into a pump spell, so. Is but, like for that, is it really even better than something like Stumber Denial? Well, I've been seeing them play it in addition to Stubborn Denial. So it's more copies of Stubborn Denial? Yes. Yes. Yep. This card does not no, look terribly we, impressive uh, to me, counter. so what is your evaluation on how good it actually is? It's fine. I mean, it, counter, it can counter creatures, which is fine. Uh, so as, if I'm understanding this correctly, the main evaluation here is you're playing it essentially assuming X is zero, and then any time it can be more than zero, it's just a bonus? Yep. Okay. So next up, we've got Soul Search. This is a two mana Orzhov Sorcery. Target opponent reveals their hand. You choose a non-land card from it. Exile that card. If the card's mana value is one or less, create a 1-1 one, one, uh, white and black spirit creature token with flying. So I think this is another card you added to the list. I've seen this card played a little bit, but this just feels like it should be definitely worse than Thoughtseize. I mean, I understand the 1-1 one, one is some value, but how often are you exiling a one mana card on two so just give me your thoughts on it yeah. so i the the main deck that i think plays this um that i've seen it in where i think it's actually good is niv um so being able to grab a thoughtsies effect off niv does matter sometimes and i think that exiling the card is better than surveil one like for a thought distortion um and that's mostly where i've seen it it's yeah, not erasure value one or right. less is like pretty minor um i don't think that's going to come up like basically ever so it's mainly for the exile part? Yeah, yeah. You can hit like a memory deluge or something with it, so. Sure. All right. I don't think there's much more to say about it beyond that, though. Nope, not really. All right. Then there is Tulsimir Midnight's Light. This is five mana, uh, green and white. So one green pip, two white pips. It's a legendary elf, 3-2 with lifelink. When it enters, you create Voge Offense Stalker, a legendary 5-5 five, five green white wolf creature with trample. And whenever a wolf you control attacks, if Tulsimir attacked this combat, Target creature and opponent controls blocks that wolf this combat if able. So 3-2 lifelink enters, you make a 5-5 trampler, and then when that trampler attacks, or another wolf, but probably just that one, and you also attack with Tulsimir, you can force the opponent to block the wolf. Yeah. So this one, I don't really expect it to see tons of very much play because it is much worse than the War of the Spark uh, Tulsimir uh, on average, but um, you can play them together, which can come up in some Yorian decks. Um, because they all have different names and the Voja has different names and stuff. Um, but I think it's just like most of these types of cards usually see some amount of play in standard. Um, like it's a lot of stats for the, the price, which is fine, but nothing like exciting. There's I'm trying to remember if there's any wolves that like see any play. Um, but well, hang on, uh, let's check. Yeah. All right. I have looked over the wolves that are legal in Pioneer and none of them see any play. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I, I as I, say, I think from what I remember, it's mostly the other Tulsimir which sees play, um, and that's about it. There's sometimes wolf tokens, um, but it's like Wolf Willow Haven and stuff like that, so nothing like uh, particularly good, I don't think. But 
So you think this is just like another one of a Yorion decks potentially? Yeah, yeah, and and it does play well with the other uh, Soul Singer at least. So like like a five five making a five five token like attached to a three two Life Linker is like pretty reasonable. So about it mostly. All right, so next up we have. Oh, I guess Ranger class. <laughs> Ranger class. That's sure. the one where like that makes a two two and then you like, level it up. Yeah, yeah. That's the only like playable wolf token right now. This Ranger class. So next up, we've got Urgent Necropsy. This is four mana Golgari instant. As an additional cost to cast the spell, you collect Evidence X, where X is the total mana value of the permanence this spell targets. Destroy up to one target artifact, up to one target creature, up to one target enchantment, and up to one target planeswalker. I've seen a lot of people be pretty high on this, and for the life of me, I don't understand why. I understand that this can hit multiple permanents, but this seems like a lot to go through in order to do that. It's four mana. You have to have a bunch of mana value in your graveyard already. So if you don't, then the, like it doesn't work. So yeah. tell me your thoughts on it. I, I, I think it's quite good, but uh, I think it's important to realize this card is probably at most like a one or two of. Um, in both Pioneer and Standard, uh, it's actually pretty reasonable to hit multiple things right now. There's uh, In Pioneer, there's like Fables, Bank Busters, Tokens, um, you know, stuff like that. And well, it seems weird to be like, well, my four mana destroy target creature is good because I got to blow up my opponent's blood token. Like, um, that's like not too, you know, that's actually like pretty solid. Um, it's it's pretty common right now that Colgan's command or Prismari command are used to kill a fable token and like uh, a treasure or a blood. Um, and that's like a pretty common line and this does a similar thing. Of note, like uh, collect evidence X with like how it works, you can inherently overpay. Um, so you don't have to exile exactly the total mana value, even though it kind of reads that way. Um, you can exile more. So um, it's actually not too bad to exile, because a lot of times you're going to be hitting like a token, like an artifact token uh, and stuff. I think it's a little better in standard, where you may have to fight through like wedding announcements and stuff like that. Like you're probably never really blowing up leyline bindings with this, but um, you, I, I think it's better to view it from the lens of like a black green Prismari command. Um, and in that sense, I think it's I think it's pretty fun. Is this basically uh, a card that's just another uh, BTL target? Yes, yes, yeah. It's really good in that. I, I do think I was playing it when I was playing leagues uh, while I was in the airport with uh, black green mid range. I was playing one copy, um, and it was pretty decent. Um, I wouldn't want to play too many copies. Like this card gets much worse the more you play. But All right. nice to not just auto lose to favor. So moving on, we've got Vanifar Evolved Enigma. This is a four mana Simic Legendary creature. It's a three, four Elfu's Wizard. At the beginning of combat on your turn, choose one. Cloak a card from your hand. So take a card from your hand, put it face down as a two, two with ward two, or put a plus one counter on each colorless creature you control. So yet another card you wanted to add to the list. So go ahead. Yeah, uh, I don't really expect this one to make any particularly large waves or anything, but um, there are some cool things you can do with this card with like um put a big creature into play and then blink it um so it curves pretty well um into uh what is it is it teleportation circle um yeah teleportation circle so any like, blink effect you can set up, yeah yeah so you can set up like blink effects and stuff like that and that's like mostly where i wanted to see the card but i do think that there's a world in which like uh we've been we're pretty close to having like a steel overseal overseer hardened scales artifact deck be like good like i've played red green ones with soul cauldron and stuff before and while this isn't actually like an artifact like maybe just like putting counters on your hanger back walkers and stuff is uh and stone cold serpents is, is like good enough so um, i have but... also played the red green scales deck in pioneer and yeah. that deck is not very good but no. the bigger point i think is that i'm surprised at how bad steel overseer is Yes, that card is awful. <laughs> it's so bad. It, you look at it and you're like, oh, it's a lord for all your artifact creatures that you can keep activating. But no, you play a two mana one one that you can't do anything with the turn it comes into play. You have to wait a turn. It's so bad. Yes. All right. So yeah, moving right. on. <laughs> uh, this yeah, is no one. Nice. This is one I added to the list. Voja Jaws of the Conclave. Five mana yeah. Naya creature. Five, uh, five, five legendary wolf. It has vigilance, trample and ward three. Uh, whenever Voja attacks, put X plus one counters on each creature you control, where X is the number of elves you control. Draw a card for each wolf you control. So on average, this is prob you're probably not controlling any other wolves, so it's drawing a card. But the bigger point is that you can put X plus one counters on all of your creatures, where X is your elf count. So for Pioneer, there is no Azuri or like Elf Lord that's a payoff in the same way as what you'd get in Modern and uh, 
further back. So this feels like the first really big payoff. So, so far, elves, elf decks have been pretty good in Pioneer, but haven't really caught on to be a major part of the metagame. And so far, the, the major payoffs that I've seen for elves are either Shaman of the Pack, Ancient Imperiosaur, and now we've got this thing. And it and feels Elvish like... Sorry, what? And Elvish War Master. Yeah, but seven mana to activate that. Yeah, I mean, you play you play Nykthos usually, but yes. So I don't know if this will be good, and right. courting for it does is quite expensive, but at the same time, if you ever do, like, untap with this in an elf deck, it feels like you should just win really? on the spot. Yes. Like, yeah, you attack and probably plus three or four your team and then just win on immediately. Yeah. Like, if you attack with this, it should be put, like, eight counters on everything, you win the game. Um... I think the challenge is like finding a way to give it haste is, would probably make it the most uh, the most viable. Yeah, you can you can cord for it. It's gonna win the game uh, faster than like cording for shaman of the pack would if you only, if you have like seven or eight elves because you you can like cord for it on end step and then untap an attack. Um, casting it may be feasible. Um, current elf lists usually play white for Werefox fox bodyguard anyway, so. It's mostly the red you would have to generate, um, but I mean, yeah, this this thing like <laughs> probably attacks and puts like minimum like six token six counters on everything you control, which should be this card should just be attack win the game in this format. Uh, hard parts getting to that point. So before we move on, I do want to mention uh, for Voja. So I originally didn't have this on the list, and I was like, why in the world didn't I add this to the list? Like this is obviously a card for Pioneer Elves, and then I realized. Because when I went to Scryfall and I did the, you know, search for all the cards from Karlov Manor, I clicked on mm -hmm. Draft Booster, like only cards that are in Draft yeah. Boosters, so that it didn't show up yeah. all the Showcase the and all the alternate card. arts. Voja is one of a few cards that is pre-release exclusive, meaning you can only get them in pre-release packs. Why in the world are they doing this? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but you can't play them in the pre-release. Yeah, there's that too. Yeah. So like you can open yeah. this in your pre-release pack, but you're not allowed to use it in limited, but it's also standard and like other format legal. Yes. So, yeah. I mean, I guess there's probably enough pre-release packs that are distributed that it's not going to cause a huge price problem, but... I mean, there's a lot and it's usually front-loaded supply. Uh, so it's not really a problem. But how many times have we seen this problem before? Like, did we learn nothing from Nexus of Fate being a buy -a box promo yeah. exclusive? <laughs> right. Or Corvald for a while. Um, Corvald and Kenrith were like pretty pricey as well. Uh, yeah, the, the Brawl deck exclusives as well. Yep, yep. Uh, all right. No, I mean, it's definitely been a problem. Um, a little bit less so, I think, if it's a pre-release promo, because, yeah, there's a huge amount of pre-release kits out there. Uh, but what happens if, like, the next expressive iteration is, like, a pre-release promo or something like that, right? I, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's not, like, unheard of, but it, I, I don't really like those kinds of, i i think if you're doing mechanically exclusive promos you need to have a reprint path for them like on a short timeline i think so all right next up is war leaders called is a three mana boros enchantment creatures you control get plus one plus one and whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control war leaders call deals one damage to each opponent so this is a card you wanted on the list i look at this yes. card and i see a three mana anthem which have not been playable in a very long time and combined with an impact tremors, which is also not typically very good in you know non EDH yes. formats, but you are very high on this card, so let me know why. Yeah, this card may be one of the most. It may be one of the best pioneer and standard cards from this set. This card is incredibly good. So yeah, like both of the part, both of the modes on their own, we wouldn't really play. We would pay two mana sometimes for an anthem in constructed now, but you wouldn't pay three for both. Being able to do both just makes it like. It, it just plays so well. I, now, the default is to play it in decks like uh, uh, Convoke decks. Um, you play a bunch of one mana creatures, you play like token generation, you have all that stuff. So it's kind of like a resolute, I guess the best way to pair it is resolute reinforcements and imidanes create like super fast combo kills with this card. So like resolute is kind of like you make two two twos that each deal one, which is like you know, so it's kind of like it's a double anthem for a lot of your deck. And if you're playing Imidanes or Bushwhackers with like haste and stuff, it also is like a double anthem. Uh, and that's like, you know, Gleefuls, a Knight Errant of Yost, stuff like that. So uh, in standard, um, I think the Convoke deck is really good in standard right now. Um, and you play three or four of this, like not particularly close. In Pioneer, most aren't playing it. I'm playing one 
uh, right now, and I've been pretty happy with it. Um, three men is a lot harder in Pioneer than in Standard, but uh, but yeah, I like this card quite a bit. Um, it's also, <laughs> yeah, like <laughs> I knew this card would be money because of Commander, because for whatever reason, Impact Tremors was like a $3 comment for a while. Um, and uh, this is like a six or seven dollar rare, um, but yeah, it, it doesn't look very good on the surface. But uh, at least in standard, it's incredibly good, um, and I think it's pretty decent in Pioneer. I remain unconvinced, but I could be wrong, and we will see how it pans <laughs> yeah. out. Yeah, I think it's. Uh, I, I didn't actually like map it up. I was explaining to someone that like if you curve out with this card, which is pretty easy to do, uh, most of the decks that want to play this play like a bunch of one drops. So assuming that you play a one drop, your opponent probably doesn't want to kill a Thraven Inspector um, or an Epicure. Uh, so you're probably going to have that. Um, on two, usually you play, um, it's usually like Resolute Reinforcements for these kinds of decks. If you just go like Resolute Reinforcements, play this, it's just like a normal Anthem. But then when you untap and you play Imidanes, the game is over. Uh, it's like 20 something damage, like, you know, they just die. Um, so that's where like the card is... Uh, it's worse than an anthem, like if you're not developing after. So that's that's why it mostly fits into like Imidanes and uh, decks like that. So. All right. So let's move on to our final multicolor card, mm -hmm. World Souls Rage. It's X red green sorcery. Deal X to any target, and then put up to X land cards from your hand and or graveyard onto the battlefield tapped. So uh, I am not convinced. This is one you wanted on the list. I've seen some other people mention it as well. I get that you can put lands from your hand on the battlefield, which seems like it's okay in Amulet Titan, but typically, like, I want creatures that are just going to allow me to play multiple lands a turn. Like, I don't see this being better than Dryad or Azusa. And you usually don't have, like, double bounce land in your hand to just put all of them down. So either convince me why this is good in Amulet or why it's good somewhere else. So, yeah, I mean, I mostly wanted to put it because I don't know enough about Amulet to know whether it's good. My instinct would tell me you wouldn't cut any of those other cards for it, but I do know a bunch of Amulet people are playing it, and I know some people are going to continue playing it, so I'm not sure exactly what would make it there. I do think it is playable in Pioneer, um, but I would, like, I kind of wanted some of the, like, ramp-style, like, decks to be able to have access to something where it's, okay, kill a creature and put a land into play. And so in Pioneer, like, I would be fine in a lot of matchups doing this for, like, two or three mana and just putting in, like, one or two lands. Um, I, and I think in Pioneer, putting lands from Graveyard probably matters a little bit more than in other formats. Um, just because, like, you can play more, like, random mill cards or discard or you know, stuff to Crocs or Fable, the Mirror Breaker and stuff. Um, but I'm definitely going to try it in like the World Tree deck, uh, stuff like that, or like Splendid Reclamation decks. Uh, but I mostly just wanted it on here because I, I have seen a lot of Amulet type uh, players play it, but I'm not sure whether- I look at it and it feels like it's too expensive for what you're trying to do. Like, I don't feel like there's any amount of mana other than straight up killing your opponent that I would be happy to pay for. And I also think it's too difficult to get lands off of it, like enough lands to where it counts, especially be, even in modern where you have fetch lands, I don't think this goes into a standard fetch land deck. So like an Amulet Titan, Amulet Titan doesn't play fetches, or if it does, it plays just a tiny amount. Right. Yeah, I mean, again, like I, I don't really know enough about deck in modern to speak on that, but I, I will say from like both a standard and, and a pioneer perspective, I think playing this card for X is two and just killing a small creature and doing this is actually very good. Um, I know a lot of people kind of look at these things and, and you know, it's it's expensive to do these effects, but doing two different things is like, you know, pretty reasonable. There's a lot of like small creatures to kill in both Pioneer and Standard that like end up actually mattering, um, you know, but I, I don't know. Like, See, uh, that's not the problem for me. And the problem for me is like, if you get to four mana and you're killing a two drop or a two, two creature, what is the likelihood that you actually have extra lands that you want to turbo out at that point? Like it's turn four. I mean, that's like, okay, so, so the argument is, is like, um, if you don't have lands to turbo out, that doesn't inherently, like, then you evaluate the card from the perspective of, it, would my turn have been fine if I just cast a Shatter Skull Smashing this turn and killed one thing, right? Like, um, you know, I, I think the way that you would want to play this in, like, Pioneer is, like, you want to play with cards like Fable or Self Mill cards and stuff, so you at least get, like, something back from it. Um, but I'm not sure, like, exactly what the shell would look like. Um, but I do think because, like, it's X damage to any target, like, I'm fine sometimes just playing, like, you know, five mana, kill a three toughness creature. Like, if it's, like, a split card with that or, like, 
a ramp spell, you know, I think that makes it a little, little bit better. Like, I'm comfortable enough, like, not getting full value off of my cards a lot of times, but I, I the, the thing I don't like about cards like this is that it kind of punishes me for playing, like, spike field hazards and uh, uh, stuff like that, that I would otherwise like to play, uh, because you can't put those in off of it. Isn't that more an indictment of the modal lands, if anything? Uh, I don't think it's really an indictment, uh, but because, yeah, like a card like this wouldn't really function if it said, like, you can play, you get X extra land plays and you may play, you know, because I would rather it be worded like this. See, I've been thinking about the modal lands a lot, and I feel like they should all be reversed. It should be front side land, yes. back side spell, because it is so ridiculous that your land spots in the deck are able to count towards, like, things that care about certain types being in your graveyard or, or fetching yeah. or that you have like modal lands that are big creatures on the front side that you can reanimate yep, yep. yeah i think so like i i kind of i pretty i agree with that I or that they that. enable or that now they've enabled like one la like uh oops all spells and belcher decks to exist like those decks are not even that good but they're just yeah. terrible gameplay i mean obviously the trade-off if you make them lands is like um then like rhinos can play spike field hazards you know, but that seems fine to me. Uh, so, like, but I, yeah, I would rather they be lands first because it feels pretty bad sometimes to be putting, uh, like, I would love to put Valakut Awakening into my Arboreal Grazer decks. Um, because well, there's the there seems to be this increasing desire to. So I understand the the, the idea is that. Variance is often not fun. It's no fun to get mana screwed or flooded. And so you want to try to mitigate that. But I think they've gone overboard in the other direction. And now everything's way too consistent. Where it's like all of your lands now have spells attached to them. Or all of your spells now have lands attached to them. Or everything loots and cycles and rummages. And so don't worry. You'll never feel bad. You'll never get bricked. Right. Yeah. No, I, it's, I think it definitely, definitely feels that way. Um, I think a lot of their designs kind of reflect it. Like, like probably the, the most egregious ones are Lorien Revealed and Troll of Cause of Doom. Oh, yeah. I mean, cycling is a good, healthy way to do that, but those cards are a little too pushed for, like, what they do. Um, I think land cyclers for one mana is pretty much a mistake. Um, it's just, like, an Arkham's Astrolabe problem, I think. So. All right, well, that's another discussion. So that is the end of our multicolor cards. We only have... Two things left to discuss, and those are lands. So first up, Escape Tunnel. Sacri tap, Sacrifice, Escape Tunnel, search your library for a basic land card, put it on the battlefield, tap, then shuffle, or Tap, Sacrifice, Escape Tunnel, target creature with power two or less can't be blocked this turn. So they power crept Evolving Wilds, finally. Uh, so obviously this card is probably not playable in most 1v1 formats, but in Popper, where land fixing yeah. absolutely sucks, this <laughs> yes. has... The potential application of there are multiple popper decks that care about having a single creature that gets pumped a whole bunch to kill your opponent. So some immediately come to mind are there is Infect, there is the Kiln Fiend decks, mm -hmm. and then to a lesser extent, there's Tireless Tribe combo, and there is the uh, Daru Specialist Cleric footing. So there's multiple decks where you you have a turn where you start off with a creature that's low power, and then that one creature gets pumped and kills your opponent. So this gives you. Yep a land that mana fixes but also makes your creature unblockable so i think this is going to be a staple in basically all of those decks yep all right and then finally the surveil lands so this is a cycle of dual color lands that tap for uh one of two different colors in all the 10 color pairs they are all also the basic land types of the colors they are so they're fetchable and they say they enter tapped and when they enter you surveil one so similar to the temples that we've seen uh, that we originally got from Theros, but in this case you're surveilling instead of scrying, which is not better in every circumstance, but will usually be better, but also they're fetchable. So yes. I'm already seeing them show up in a bunch of places. In particular, I think I see Hedge Maze and Lotus Field a bunch. Mm -hmm. um, it strikes me that yes, and so in a certain combo decks, you might have like certain combo pieces that you can never afford to put in your graveyard, not Lotus Field obviously, but there may be other ones. So. They're not like strictly better than the scry lands, but they're almost always, they're like most of the time going to be the same or better. Yes. So if there's decks that wanted to play scry lands already, like Lotus Field, these seem just like upgrades for those. For modern, I am dubious about two color lands that always enter tapped. I've been rigorously trained to think that lands that are have mandatory enter the battlefield tapped 
where there's no condition where they enter untapped are terrible outside of like multicolor decks that are playing the triumphs to enable domain and all their colors. And even those are only like one to two copies usually. But what is your analysis of these lands in, uh, again, um, mostly like Pioneer and Modern, I'm assuming are where I we're going? For most, most Modern decks, if you're not playing one, you're just throwing away win percentage. I think these are really good. There are a lot of games and, and part of it is is um, because Modern doesn't really have fetchable tap utility lands that like people don't think about the scenarios where they're playing in a game where they would like absolutely love to have that. And it comes up a huge amount. Um, I think obviously like it makes, you know, uh, like Rhinos and stuff gets to play them a bit more free than like Scam, for example. But um, I think most decks actually will greatly benefit from the first copy. Um, most of all, but there's a lot of scenarios in every format in Magic where you can play a tap land and it does not affect, uh, you know, and it doesn't like put you behind. There's there's tons of turns like that. Um, because like maybe you have like two one mana removal spells and so you can play a tap land on turn two for free and then still you know interact like that. But we're we're not really trained to think about those scenarios in modern very much. Um, but I do think people should be playing them. I think they're pretty good. For maybe Amulet Titan doesn't really want to. Um, for the case of uh, of modern play, are we saying that these should only go in the two color decks, and then when you get to three plus, that's where you play triumphs instead? No, I think um, no, I think I would play them in three color decks as well. So. And then in, in Pioneer, is my analysis correct that these are basically just if you had a deck that was interested in playing uh, uh, Scrylands, you're just upgrading them with these? I think there's a lot more nuance in both Pioneer and Standard because so it's kind of like the difference between opt and consider. Uh, there are plenty of decks in Magic that would play Consider but not Opt, and I think that's true for Scrylands. For example, I'm playing the Scryland in Phoenix, but I would never play Temple in Phoenix, right? Um, and then I think one of the other things, too, that you can do in Pioneer as well is the land types do matter in some scenarios. Like, you can actually make a creativity list now that has enough um, mountains for Dwarven Mine to be playable. And that was an old version of creativity in in uh, Pioneer that that played that as well. But you had to play Volatile Fjord. Uh, but now, like you know, you have enough playable ones. Um, I think the blue white one is one that should come up more. There's plenty of decks that play Irrigated Farmland and Cycling the Land. Like basically never comes up, but Surveilling is like generally better. Um, and like you know, so I think Archive is like you know a shoehorn. I think Undercity Sewers is also like you know really good. Um, uh, I think more decks should be uh, should be playing these, but I think it's hard to evaluate because most people are used to like, well, temples suck, right? You know, temples are really bad, but um, I think there's a big gulf between temples and like land types slash uh, surveil one if like um, that. I think some decks that wouldn't play temples absolutely would play would play these. Um, so the upsides are they have basic land types, which means things that care about that matter, yes. uh, including things like besage you. You can besage you into them. If your opponent okay. hits hits you, okay. would besage you. Um, yep. They have the fact that it's surveilling means that you have graveyard synergies. So if you have any yeah. card that has flashback or delve yeah. or you know otherwise cares That's about the graveyard, yeah. then these are upgrades to that. And then yeah. so basically, if like if you don't have anything that cares about graveyards whatsoever in your deck, like you have no flashback spells at all, and you don't care about the land type, then you probably don't care about this in fetchless formats. For the most part, yeah. But most of the decks that are typically like that tend to be like your aggro decks, um, usually. So So I would imagine the, the best ones play. here are probably basically like it's essentially what decks can you afford to have a turn taken off or can you afford to have yeah. less mana? So probably control decks where you're making up for it later off of sweepers or uh, tempo Locking decks range. where you've got a lot of one mana spells that where you it doesn't matter that your land is entering tapped because you can just use the one that you played on turn one or something. So probably I, the I, ones I, that are the best ones are like the blue ones and then maybe like underground mortuary because that's because because Golgari is like the dredge colors. Yeah, so I think um, mortuary fits really well into uh, the spelunking deck because it kind of wanted that before, but it's also a land type for cottage and gingerbread cabin. Um, it's a swamp force for that. Um, and you kind of want to put cards in Graveyard uh, as well with that deck because you do play like Splendid uh, Reclamation and stuff. Um, I think Phoenix decks can play a Thundering Falls. I think the blue ones are generally the best, yes. Um, I think the Rakdos one is good um, in Pioneer. Um, you do like your Graveyard is almost a second hand when you play Rakdos, uh, similar with like the black-white one, but 
Um, those are kind of slower mid-range your control decks. Um, Mortuary, I'm playing two in in Golgari mid, and two of that and two Cottage, um, just because you, you want your lands to do something. Um, but I, I think the worst one is red, white, and green, white are probably the worst. Um, Basically aggro like, colors. Yeah, but I do think the red, green one fits pretty well into, into World Tree, so... But, but yeah, the blue ones, blue and black ones should be the best for these in Pioneer and Standard. So finally, that is all of the cards that we're discussing. So now for the end segment, the best cards in the set. So what in our opinion is the best card in the set? Five. So number five for Dylan is? No More Lies. Oh, I also have No More Lies at number five. Yeah. The thinking behind it is, I guess, like it doesn't really upgrade that much. It basically just upgrades Blue White Control and Pioneer, but it is a... I think a better upgrade than what it looks like. You know, it's not just, oh, you're just going to play it instead of make disappear. Like the the additional mana payment matters and the exile matters. Yeah, like, and it does slot into some other decks. Some decks are sideboarding it. Niv is really happy to play it because it's a counter spell that's multicolored that you can grab, um, which comes up a lot. So just really, and I think it arguably helps Niv more than it helps Blue White as well. So yeah, it's number five for me. All right, so since we both had the same number five, I'll reveal my number four. My number four is Archdruid's Charm. I think this card is already in two decks immediately. It seems to be a huge upgrade to Lotus Field, and it is an upgrade to uh, Monogreen Devotion, although I don't know if that necessarily makes Monogreen Devotion a good deck again, but it's definitely a good addition to it. And just yeah, like one of the biggest playable. problems with Monogreen was just not being able to find your Nykthos. This means you always get mm -hmm. to find it. And it being a modal spell, that means that you can find whatever broken land that you need to pay off with. Plus, you can just go find threats once you have that broken land. It means that you have fewer dead draws it's also in your a deck. Spell. And it's a removal spell for multiple different card types. Mm -hmm. So it's always live. All right. What's your number three? Oh, my. Well, I didn't do my number four. Oh, sorry. Your number four was not Archdruid's Charm. No, What's your number my four? My number four was Toft's Eidetic Memory. Uh -huh. I think this card is really good. I've been extremely happy with it. Um, and I think it's probably more likely to make its own archetype than anything else. Um, we don't really see blue cards that just suddenly like win the game out of nowhere uh, very often, but uh, it does it quite well. And it plays uh, pretty absurd with Treasure Cruise. So you're not even necessarily convinced that it'll be a Phoenix staple? Right, right. Like I'm playing one in Phoenix and I'm very happy with it, but like I think there's a... I feel like there's got to be a better deck for it out there. So, yeah. All right. What's your number three? Uh, Insidious Roots is Insidious my... Insidious Roots is also my number three. Yeah. The card is just I, I... completely bonkers. And yeah. the Insidious Roots deck is new on the field, so a lot of people haven't had really much time to get to see it. But holy crap, when their engine starts going off, it just feels impossible to win, unless you're blue-white. Yeah, it, it, it snowballs incredibly well, like... Yeah, uh, I think the main thing holding it back from being higher with me is I feel like it's an incredibly difficult deck to like get perfectly well built because it's so new and we haven't really had to like think in those dimensions before. Um, but it, it just has such a high potential and the potential of the cards is usually like where I would wait um, my like whenever if I whenever I do top five lists like I'm always more interested in like, uh, you know, the i feel like the the like format potential of a card rather than like is this the most powerful card so one of the cards that seems to be and it, i think it's going to be the staple in this deck is scrap heap scrounger because the ability yes. exiles a creature you trigger and then scrap heap scrounger returns yep. you trigger again yep yep and you can respond to it by exiling another one if you uh if you need to as well so my number two is the surveil lands so they're obviously fundamentally changing a whole bunch of decks. They seem to be upgrades to a bunch of different things. And yeah, a lot of like the temples have generally sucked and have only gone in very specific, usually like combo decks where you are, we're already not going to be playing anything in the first one to two turns of the game anyway. The only decks that I can really recall even ever playing them are essentially Lotus Field, Adnaz and Modern, and then like occasionally control decks would play them. Yeah, some of the Yorian decks will play it just because you're low on duels and, you know, it's fine. And Yorian decks tend to play a little slower anyway. Uh, yeah. But having lands that bin the card seems a huge upgrade. Yep. Yep. Definitely agree. Um, my number two is Deadly Cover-Up. Deadly uh, Cover-Up. exclusively because of, of Pioneer. I think this card is... Uh, uh, I think decks like Rakdos, I think... Um, 
the mono black garbage deck, as I call it. That deck is awful, but I think the that waste not deck. Well. well, not I mean, waste not version is bad, but even the versions that don't play waste not are bad. Um, like just play second color, but those decks benefit immensely from deadly cover up. I, I, I think the card is just really good. Um, because to reiterate, it's basically like all of those creature decks that were that had some sort of graveyard value, like. Yeah. the insidious roots cauldron familiar deck amalia phoenix now you just sweep the board and take whatever recursive threat they had and eat it and yeah. then their whole deck dies yeah. i mean i think i think a fundamental aspect of pioneer that i like that makes it different from uh modern of years past is most decks play cards that are kind of bad and you play like an engine card or a couple of engine cards and like you have a lot of cobble together like a backup plan of mid-range stuff um the and and so like that is a very abusable by a card like this where like amalia's backup plan is play some creatures uh make a big wild growth walker and attack a bunch get some chip damage in and and attack um and like you know phoenix you know tries to grind you out with resources even like you know the mayhem devil decks and stuff like have like other backup plans so everyone has some kind of value backup plan but this just like deletes your board and then also removes your primary plan just makes it really difficult to come back from uh, so and your number one is surveillance that's my number one all right my number one and i'm surprised you didn't have this anywhere on your list is leyline of the guild pact yeah because i don't think it is a top five card you don't think it's top five card all right well we're already seeing mono green kind of resurge although again who knows like without karn people are really having to go back to the drawing board and figure out how to make the mono green deck work and it feels like it's kind of got problem matchups where there's like a bunch of combo stuff such as Amalia that it just doesn't, it's not equipped to beat yeah. Yeah. no matter how much Amalia's you're ramping. Almost unbeatable. <laughs> so it's kind of iffy there, but it's also showing up in Rhinos, which is having crazy win percentages in Modern. And I think just fundamentally, this card does such broken bullshit by having free a free permanent that's all the colors that lets you just start off with a ton of devotion in play start have totally color fix all of your mana so you have no color issues for the rest of the game combines with sign of draco and other cards like that even outside of sign of draco like it means that territorial kavu is immediately a five five you've got so all the domain stuff anything that cares about colors and then even in your hand unlike all the other lane lines it's all five colors so it pitches to all the pitch spells so it's never dead it seems just absurd to me yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I just take issue with a lot of those points because, like, I, I think a good example is, like, this card doesn't really enable domain, like, at all. Um, enabling domain is not a problem for any deck, really. Like, uh, the domain aggro decks before this card existed were totally fine. Like, Kavu was almost always a 5-5 five, five on 2 anyway. Like, I think it's almost exclusively just... Scion and Nykthos are really the only things that make this like, like if those cards didn't exist, this card would see zero play. Um, you know, um, like that, that's like the, the issue I have with it is like, I actually am pretty sure. I don't think it's actually good with Nykthos in pioneer either. Um, I think, uh, I think the better versions just like don't play. I was not happy, um, uh, in the Nykthos deck, but I think the I, abilities that it gets are just so fundamentally busted that it's gonna but see play not. with it's gonna see play with more st like yes right now at least initially it seems like nykthos and scion are the only cards that it combines with but it feels like this is gonna combine with other stuff either yet to be printed or someone's gonna find them i don't think the abilities it has are worth even one mana um i think i think turning all your lands in every basic land type is basically worthless um like I turning all your things into colors, all your permanents into colors is basically worthless. These are not good things. Hang on, since this um, modifies basic land types, this doesn't get around Blood Moon, right? Blood Moon still stops you because it doesn't make them basic. It just makes them have the basic types, right? Yeah, it should. It should be. Um, I don't think Blood Moon shuts it off. All right, so that is all of the cards that we've gone over from Murders at Karlov Manor. So. Let us know what you thought. If you think we left out anything important or if we had some analysis, right or wrong, just leave your thoughts in the comments and we'll see you next time.